Buckman's Podcast, Season 5, Episode 11. My name is Timitra. I am in Toronto, Ontario, and I'm joined once again by Jonathan Kuline in Mississauga, Ontario. Hello there, kids. And we have Jaime Lopez Jr. on the line in Seattle, Washington. How's it going? Pretty good. Soon to be uh, El Paso, apparently. All right. So, first question I have for you guys today is, what happened 43 years ago today, December 8th? 1979. Oh, John, giving away too much. John Lennon. No, that was 1980. Oh. But you're right. Wow, that was, for, uh, wow, a year later. Hmm. Forgot about that. Yes. December 8th, 1980, we lost John Lennon. Yeah. That was 42 uh, years ago. 42? What happens 43 years ago? See, it's, it was, no idea. the loss of John Lennon was so big, you've forgotten what happened 43 years ago on when, this day. When I was a small child. When you were a small child. <clears throat> How old you would have been, what? Four? Five. Yeah, it would have been five. Five. Yeah. Five. Okay. That was a seminal day for you in your, in your fifth, fifth year of existence. Uh, I mean, you weren't even around then, were you? I would not. Not until 81. Wow. Well, what do you think your parents were watching <laughs> two years before you were born? Uh, I don't know. Like, like, was, it, was it Star, Dallas Star or Trek Destiny or something? Motion picture? Ten years after the end of the, the Star Trek original series TV show, the movie... Star Trek the movie there you go. came out on December eighth, nineteen seventy nine. Oh, that was a guess, and mm. I got it right. Yeah. <clears throat> um, also, here's one just to to put a hat on a hat. Uh, sure. Two thousand one, this day, Fellowship of the Ring came out in movie theaters. No way. Yes, I sense a, a like conspiracy kind of thing. December eighth, wow. really? the day the magic happens. Absolutely. That's you know what happened on December eighth. Back in the 50s, I can't say the year because I'll get killed. <laughs> Your sister was born? My sister was born, that's <laughs> correct. <laughs> yep. And you know who yeah. died on this date in 1967? No, who? Otis Redding. On this date? On this date. December 8th. December 8th. Wow. Is, that, is this a bad omen or a good omen for this show? I don't know. Oh, hang on, hang on. I lied. I lied. It gave me the wrong day. I was just looking up what happened this day, and it's fake it's, news, ladies and gentlemen. Fake news. That was no, it's December tenth. December tenth was that day. Sorry, that's my bad. Well, by the time you're listening to this, it will have dead. happened. Yeah, yeah. In the future. Yeah. Of the past. Yeah. Past of the future. Anyway. Well, that right, was, well, a, that was some good Star Trek trivia, though. Good job, man. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. I just saw it on Mon- on Mastodon just before, and then people were going on about how it's <laughs> such a it was such a great movie. They can't wait to get the 4K version. I'm like, are you crazy? mad people 4k ain't gonna make that movie better are you kidding those flyby scenes will just fly by i mean the only good thing about that movie was it had been 10 years i mean like you know it was 17 years between um and was it a new hope or 17 years between return of the jedi and um uh, phantom menace jonathan's it, favorite movie of all time it, i don't you know it, yeah no it's attack of the clones is the low water mark i think Oh, Rise of Skywalker yeah, no, but, also. But, well, I mean, but you remember, you and I went to the, we went to the same exact theater to watch Phantom Menace, where I watched Star Wars, which is now called A New Hope, in that same theater, the Varsity Theater in Toronto. And we saw it across the street from where I saw Star Wars for the first time, which was at the Bloor, which was across the street, which got bulldozed. Hmm. Well, I think, yeah, I saw it, well, and then I saw it on, at the university, which I think it was a pottery barn for a while, but anyway, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. don't know what it is now. It's a parking lot now, I think. Yeah, condos, because that's the answer in Toronto, condos. It's a condo, yeah, it's a condo, it's a condo. All right, well, let's move on to the fact check. So we were talking last week about Slow Horses, season mm-hmm. two, which premiered, like I said, it was coming out sometime before Christmas. Well, it came out last Friday on December 2nd, so, and I did watch it. Uh, still an amazing show, still a great show, and um, it is, the reason it's called Slow Horses is that they they are actually in Slow, slow House. L S L O U G H, and that's why slow house becomes slow horses. Slow horses to the people in MI5 who dis- dis- disrespect the office. And um, Gary Oldman plays a great character. And in fact, I looked up the the books. They're based on this season. They're based on a series of five books. So I would assume this is going to go for five seasons. And I'm afraid to get the books because I have a feeling that the episodes are very mirror mirror the the um the actual seasons, right? So I don't want to don't want to jinx myself or ruin ruin the plots for me because the plots are really good, right? Um, but you know, I'm gonna and it's and, it's, and you're right, Jonathan. It's a spycraft show. I think I kind mm-hmm. of 
skirted around your answer last week, but or last time we were on the show, I should say. Um, yeah, so really enjoy slow ho- slow horses. As soon as you guys get into it, it'd be great. And and I'll I'll look up the um, when we're doing some other other things. I'll come back with a fact check on the on the author because I did look up the books on um, on the Amazon machine. And you were right last week, last time when on the show you said that Gary Oldman played Zorg. You weren't sure if that was the right name in Fifth Element. You weren't exactly right. That was his name. Yeah. And uh, Jaime was uh, close to what he said on the episode last week. Doll is the handiwork of the protégés of Dr. Eric Soon, a geneticist who defeated, defected from the Federation. That's a quote from the actual show. Mm-hmm. But... Um, yeah, pro, he was the, the protege, not ne, not necessarily descendants or the whatever, or his students, I guess, right? And uh, guess what? There are five seasons of Yellowstone on Amazon Prime Canada, so you know, get your fix on it and get start start binging that today, and then you know, never listen to the show again because we'll probably never mention it again. <laughs> and uh, I believe Jaime has a. Uh, is this, are, are we into the headline? No, these are still, still pack checks? Pack, pack yeah, checks. so I had mentioned the, um, the, when we were talking about Power Rangers because of the passing of, uh, of Tommy, the Green Ranger, um, I'd mentioned that there were a Key and Peel a sketch, and it was the Power Falcon sketch, where it gets real racist calling the, uh, the Green Ranger Black Ranger. <laughs> he's yeah, like, yeah, he's he's green, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And then prior to that, uh, uh, a mere 12 years ago from College Humor was the Zordon is a racist sketch that they did. That's uh, e- even further with uh, funny things like uh, like two black rangers. You can guess why. And uh, the, uh, the janitor, Jorge, ends up with a power sombrero, which is... <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> these, these, are, these are great. So I just went down that little rabbit hole of... Uh, Power Rangers sketches that go on the uh, the really poor choices they made in terms of assigning the colors to these uh, you know racially diverse cast of kids. And coming back to just the fact check, I promised you guys um, the uh, Slow Houses is a series of books written by Mike Heron, and apparently they're, they're like considered the new John Le Carre kind of um, stories and uh one more thing oh by the way john do you know the executive producer of this show is graham yost uh who did justified mm. and the americans and isn't that eloe yost's son remember eloe yost from he was like a movie critic that was on channel 19 yeah back in yeah, the day? yeah yeah i know TVO. the name yeah 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 i, I don't know yeah, i was... don't know if they're related but yeah cool I think they are. I think that's, I think definitely there's, that's the definite line between the two, but we'll, of course, we'll have to fact check. That there you go. Time, fact yeah. check for the fact check. Always my favorite. <sighs> anyway, <laughs> sorry. Jaime's got some more, uh, I believe you got some more fact check for us. Yeah. I don't know what the latest and greatest is on a hive social. Um, I think we had talked briefly about it, um, related to Mastodon and the, the potential exodus from Twitter. Uh, but Hive Social unfortunately ran into problems with uh, people being able to hack pretty easily into private posts and private messages and et cetera. And so they had to pull the plug on their servers to just stop the pain while they figure out how to uh, make things more secure. So uh, be real yeah. careful with that sort of stuff. Um, and I think we did not recommend Hive Social, even though it became no. sort of weirdly popular in like uh, certain circles. Yeah, I, d- I did check it out, and and yeah, I immediately regretted creating an account because you know you can't go in there and not see stuff you shouldn't ought to see. So I didn't think it was suitable for anybody. Never mind the kid kidlings and stuff like that. Mm. Anyway, all right, let's move on to the headlines. And Jonathan has some sad news for us. Yeah, we'll, we'll start with some sort of Star Trek news. So uh, a a prominent actor from one of those Star Trek movies uh, died this week. Kirstie Alley. Uh, probably best known for her role on Cheers, uh, taking over for Shelley Long and having a long run on that show, uh, but also who was the original actress in Star Trek II playing Lieutenant Savick. Uh, she died this week at the age of 71 after a battle with cancer. So that was very sad news. Yeah. Um, and by the way, she, she was, I think she definitely, this was her breakout role, Savick. It was. I, I remember, yeah, I remember her and then she immediately went to Cheers after that. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it certainly was. And uh, yeah, and it, it's funny because I remember at the time, I, you know, I saw Star Trek II in the theater, um, 
and didn't really think much of it. And then I saw Star Trek three in the theater and I never made the connection that that was supposed to be the same character because it was such a a completely different looking, looking actress. Yeah. It was so old. Would you have been? Oh, uh, 10, 10, 10 or 10 or 11. You know, I I was a kid, you know, and I I had an eye, but again, it wasn't as common, I think, as it kind of can be now for that sort of recasting to happen. Obviously you're right. You know, Kirstie was so, uh, you know, it was such a breakout for her. And then she immediately sort of became, you know, one of the Hollywood, you know, it people and got a, a great role in a great show. So she wasn't going to come back and do a, another Star Trek movie. So they, they recast the role. Um, but I do wonder that sometimes because obviously Savick was in two, then she was in three and then Savick was supposed to come back for six, right? The, the role that they eventually gave. Yeah. Uh, yep. that they recast Kim to, the Kim Cattrall role was supposed to be Savick. And I, and I can't help but think sometimes how different that franchise would have felt, how much more connected those six movies would have felt if that had been the same actor in all of those movies. And that was their arc. Cause it, it feels so disjointed with the, you know, obviously they completely changed the character for six because the actress who played Savick in three didn't want to come back. But, um, yeah. Especially since they had that mentor-mentee relationship you well, know, between it, Spock right? and, yeah. Yeah. and the female officer. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think it really would be interesting. Anyways, uh, not to digress too far into the Star Trek of it all, but yeah, Kirstie Alley was a, was a major Hollywood A-list celebrity for a long time. Uh, I uh, Another role that I'm particularly fond of is uh, she was the, the uh, romantic lead in Summer School with Mark Harmon. Uh, I always found that movie hilarious. Just, you know, stupid, goofy fun you know movie you put on when you're you know 14 years old i must have watched that uh, a ton of times but uh yeah it was it was kind of uh, a shock when i saw that come across the wire the other night that uh, that she was gone again I, I hadn't been aware that she was sick but um you know obviously she's been in, in and out of the news for years with her her battles with her weight and obviously she was a a well-known scientologist so there was a lot of sort of kerfuffle very, very opinionated woman too as well but you know we're, we're not going to speak ill of the dead right no no i mean obviously we're we're here to celebrate her life not to to knock her down but yeah it was it was a it was a sad thing to to uh you know again anytime you lose those people from your from your uh youth and and that it's it sort of hits home and again you know we're sort of seeing more and more of these people from the 80s that are that are uh shuffling loose this mortal coil and uh yeah it's sort of sad and shocking but yeah but there's even more bad news yeah yeah so this came from hollywood reporter this week um that patty jenkins has said that uh there is not going to not only is she not going to be involved in a Wonder Woman three, there is going to be no Wonder Woman three with DC. Now we knew that there was going to be some changes with uh, James Gunn coming on board and the new sort of leadership at top, uh, them creating this sort of DC studios a la Marvel studios to really sort of unite in, in sort of a more cohesive way, the DC movies and really have their, they're Kevin Feige in in uh, in James Gunn. Uh, obviously, I think everyone will acknowledge that Wonder Woman nineteen eighty four was a disappointment, given how popular and uh, and you know lauded the the first Wonder Woman movie with Gal Gadot was. But still, feels a little bit you know. When I heard this this week, I was like, I guess it makes sense, but also like, I don't know. I still feel like there's a place for. Patty Jenkins as a filmmaker and, and Gal Gadot as a, as a movie star in, in whatever they're going to do next. So I'm curious to know what, uh, what they've got in mind, if they're going to recast Wonder Woman or if they're going to do more Wonder Woman, if she's going to be in, you know, only in group projects or what they're going to do next. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it's still kind of comes out of left field. What did you guys, uh, what did you guys make of this one? Yeah, it's kind of a shame. I mean, like, they, but don't forget, it did take them a while to get Batman off the ground. Oh, wait, did they ever? Um... Yeah, I guess the Dark Knight series, right? Um, and and the last one wasn't wasn't half bad, but um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's it's tough. I mean, like the thing about it is, like you know, reputationally, like sequels have always been a problem, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's very rare that you get a number two that's like an awesome, awesome movie, right? Um, you can only think of a few, like Empire Strikes Back, you know, where they kind of like knocked it out of the park, right? Well, but, Star Trek Two, we just talked about. Well, yeah, you, that's true. Yeah, yeah, that was that was quite a, a ten a times the movie. The first one is. <laughs> 180 right yeah um but star trek's always had that sort of even number rule right mm-hmm. the even number ones are generally pretty good 
Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. It's it's too bad. I mean, I, I like Gal Gadot as that character, and I also did like the Chris Pine thing, but I, I kind of found it weird the way they brought tried to bring him back. You know, um, in that sense, right? And uh, and Kristen Wiig was just way over the top as a bad person, like evil, like a M nemesis or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's too bad. It's it's an interesting. It, it's an interest. It did a lot for you know. Um, women and, and young girls watching movies to see superhero that you know looks like them kind of thing right because they really can't look to black widow not that they can anymore anyway right but yeah you know there is there aren't many many female characters out there that have the gravitas that uh wonder woman does especially in the first movie right i may be surprised by this one i am because it's a it's a character that after many years they proved hey you actually can make a lot of money from this character's movie and merchandise and you have a streaming service that sure would love to see this show up after it's been in theaters i i really hope they have a a pretty good plan for where we're you know where we're going with this because these are these are marquee characters that you don't want to leave on the on the sidelines didn't we see linda carter at the end of wonder woman 2 is that wonder woman 3 i'm thinking no that's wonder Wonder woman 2 yeah, yeah, because maybe they'll bring her series back with Lyle uh, Wagoner. And... Uh, unfortunately, Lyle's no longer with us, but... Uh... No, but I mean stream the old episodes. Yeah, you know, yeah. TOS, the, you know, the TOS, right? I, I have those uh, in a box set somebody gave me years ago of the Wonder Woman from the 1970s. They they do not hold up, but they are delightfully campy. Um, the article also mentions, if you if you scroll down, it's a pretty good piece, and it, this was an exclusive that has sort of blown up and everybody's got it now, but, uh, but Hollywood Reporter broke it. Uh, it says, also unlikely as a sequel to Black Adam, despite the hype con- surrounding the movie uh, as a, a new launching, uh, launching a new corner of the DC universe led by Dwayne Johnson, the movie has only grossed $385 million worldwide, and the movie costs uh, more than $190 million to produce, some say as much as $230 million. Uh, it it will be lucky to break even when adding in uh, all the other factors like marketing and everything else. So that's um, yeah, it's it's interesting. Cause... But that's the question too: is it still too early for for all this stuff to be coming out, especially with these huge budgets? I mean, the fact of the matter is, you're not putting bums in seats these days. Not even even still, you know. Well, and it's exactly what we talked about. You know, a few episodes back, we were talking about Avatar, right? You know. It's been a long time coming that we've been waiting for this Avatar sequel, and, you know, it looks great. I mean, inarguably, it looks great, and it probably will be a, a satisfying film, but it's still a crapshoot. You know, they said it's got to make $2 billion. I don't think there's any way. I, I, I honestly, I'll be genuinely astonished if it makes $2 billion. I will be so shocked, it, it, given just where the world is right now. Like, you know, it, you know, right now there's a triple, what, they, what was the New York Times calling it the other day? The triple-demic? There's a triple-demic going on right now. Like, there's there's three serious illnesses going around simultaneously. And there's, yeah, there's another mm-hmm. one, too, for kids now, apparently. Yeah, yeah. Just heard the other day. Yeah. So, uh, I just I just don't know how you put, as you say, enough bums in seats to get that money back. And, yeah. you know, even if it is a worldwide sensation like the first Avatar is. So, again, and that's... Avatar, which has like a huge international appeal, it's you know obviously it's different. It's not as not quite as Amero centric. Sorry, Jaime, um, but I do think that uh, you know I, I think the best thing that DC could do right now is to take a step back, take a deep breath, make some serious plans, think about how you want to tell stories, beginning, middle, and end, how they want it all to go together, and then when they feel like you know the timing is right start you know making and pushing those movies out again because it's so hard to say how this is going to go yeah and they've already got stuff in the pipeline how it all fits in i have no idea like they you know there is already an aquaman 2 movie which is done it's what it's it's coming out how the heck does that all fit in is it are they going to wait on it or they're going to bring it out anyway it's not scheduled to come out until next christmas time so okay uh, and apparently jason momoa has said he doesn't want to be Aquaman anymore. He wants to play Lobo if they come back and do a completely rebooted DC cinematic universe. Um, you know, a character that most non-comic fans don't really know. I don't know who he is. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and again, he's he's sort of Wolverine in space. You know, he's he's sort of this nasty, gritty, bounty hunter, biker guy who, you know, fight dirty in space. Right. Okay. But yeah, I think 
it'll be really interesting. Again, the decision to to not move forward with some of these products that have been popular, you know, I, I think it's really interesting. You know, again, I, I don't I don't really care about spoilers, but if you do hold your breath for for 15 seconds, apparently the PS scene at the end of Black Adam has Henry Cavill as Superman in it. Um, I don't know what to do about that. Like, is uh, is that a guarantee? Are they going to have those two in a conflict at some point in some future movie? Or is that now just a completely unsatisfying end thread, like like Deathstroke turning, turning up at the end of Batman versus Superman, right? Mm-hmm. 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 I don't know. It, it <laughs> It's so hard. It's so hard to invest in the DC cinematic universe when they clearly don't know what the heck they're doing. How are we supposed to know what the heck they're doing? Yeah. I don't know. All right. Well, well, speaking of unmemorable uh, previews, <laughs> well, we had we had a few trailers drop and a big sort of bonanza of trailers recently, and uh, so I thought maybe we could just sort of have a quick uh, impressions about. Uh, we got Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, so we found out the name of it and also got the first trailer there. We got Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three, and we got Transformers: Rise of the Beasts. Uh, so let's start with Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. What uh, what are your impressions of of this one, just based on the trailer with with eighty year old Harrison Ford? Well, like I said, I saw it, but I for the life of me can't remember anything about it, <laughs> except that maybe there were some boxes and he was teaching a class and he has a hat, a whip, and a whip. Oh, yeah, no, there was yeah, a whip. The, the scene, the scene with the whip and the gun, they kind of play back that uh, very first time, you know, when when. Indy's, Indy's fighting the big giant guy and he pulls out a gun and shoots him. They sort of play on that sort yeah, of scene, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah, but other than that, I mean, I, yeah, don't really remember much of it. But I'll still go out and see it because it's shiny and it's got Indiana Jones on the label. Hi, May. Yeah, I also don't remember a lot except the um, de-aged Harrison Ford. And around the same time, Disney had come out with some sort of news from its you know technology department about doing some of that stuff. Um, you know, advances that it made. And so um, on the, you know, maybe not the big screen, it, it seemed, you know, pretty convincing or at least better than other efforts that I've seen. Um, not to say leaps and bounds above, but like the tech is getting pretty, pretty good so far. We'll see how it holds up for, for longer than just, you know, 500 milliseconds on a, on a quick scene in a trailer. Yeah. yeah. I don't remember. Maybe, maybe James Cameron can DH some of the characters in uh, Avatar as well. <laughs> well the nice thing about making them blue cats is that you can age them however much you want or not true yeah yeah uh yeah i thought it was you know uh, it's hard not to be like ah oh, there he is with the hat and the whip and not feel a little romantic swell in your heart but i'm i'm trying to keep my rational self in the lead in this one and be like but he's also 80 years old i I don't know. I'm still really conflicted about this one. It just he's looks... He's 80 years old? He's, 80, 80, He's. I think he's 80 years old. 79 or 80 years old. It's... It's. I just can't. Wow. Uh, I, I, and, you know, DH, fine, sure. But, I, you know, I don't want to go watch a car, Indiana Jones cartoon. I want to watch an Indiana Jones live action movie. And, well, I, because but then so couldn't he couldn't he sort of be like the the Yoda of the next generation of, you know archaeologist school teacher whip guys you know yeah like why like at, you know because that's what really happens in real life you know an 80 year old person doesn't actually you know ride horses and jump off of trains and you know yeah uh he did run he, around he with did, guns he turned 80 in july so he is a, he is actually 80 full 80 years old well i mean they must have filmed this like three years ago right so uh, yeah, it was it was under construction for a while there. I think and they took their time with it because obviously, you know, like working with small children and animals, you can't work the eighty year old all day long and expect them to be That's fine. Seventy nine, seventy seven. You would have been seventy seven at that point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I was excited to see Phoebe Waller Bridge, who I adore. Um, you know, she's she's one of my favorite uh, writers and and actors. Um, so I think I'm curious to see the energy she brings to this, but. I don't know. I'm still really, I, I haven't gotten over the nuking of the fridge yet. I'm just, I'm still, I'm still struggling with this one. <laughs> I don't, I, I don't want to get too excited about it. I really, I'm taking a very cautious approach. Uh, okay. Mm-hmm. Next up was Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. So this comes hot on the heels of us getting the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special too. So we, we've gotten sort of Guardians back in the front of our minds. Uh, what did you guys take away from Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3's trailer? Looks good. Groot's grown up. 
swore yeah. he was back. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great and, um, um, uh, backing song, as they always have for these uh, Guardians of the Galaxy trailers. This was In the Meantime by Space Hog from uh, yeah. like mid-90s, which is great. Yep. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it, it, I think you made the comment on our, our Slack channel, Jaime. It's, uh, you know, it clearly looks like Rocket's story. And, and, you know, at one point we see another sort of, uh, you know, anthropomorphic animal um, that I recognize from the comic books that you, you definitely made a pretty good joke about. But, um, yeah, it's uh, it seems like this is sort of Rocket's story. And, uh, you know, it does look a little... A little emotional roller coastery, and you know this is this is the last go round, right? Obviously, James Gunn's not coming back. There was a lot of dissatisfaction around this group about the whole firing of him and rehiring of him, and obviously he's moving on to a different organization and everything else. So, you know, uh, I wonder what he pushed for and and sort of whether he got his full artistic vision. And so I'm I'm um, again I'm I 100 percent I'm going to see it. I do like the cast. I do like their energy I, i'm curious but i'm also a little bit trepidatious about you know closing the book on stories always has a, a bittersweet kind of thing and and it's hard to say how that's gonna how that's gonna play out uh transformers yeah. rise of the beasts gentlemen what was your response tim yawn <laughs> and yours Jaime? i i said they will take all my money <laughs> we can go into the reasons why um and i feel like one of those reasons is uh you know, the fact that I grew up with a Transformers Beast Wars, uh, probably mid to late 90s CGI uh, animated show that, that did a really great job. And the the second part is the characters here continue the Bumblebee movie character designs and, and sort of tone where I can recognize from a very long you know distance anybody like who this is. And they're not um, random scraps of metal moving around with the same names, right? Like these are like clearly this is Optimus Primal, and clearly this is Optimus Prime. Those are different characters. Yes, <laughs> deep cuts here in in the movie. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if they'll follow the exact same continuity here of of the Beast Wars show, which had some great Transformers lore. Uh, but the, the the gorilla one is uh, Optimus Primal. Uh, I, I presume that. Yeah, and and the uh, you know the the Mac truck is Optimus Prime, and and again it just seems really um, well done. I didn't see who's uh, who's directing this one. This is uh, this a Bay Fest? I'm guessing no. Uh, Stephen Capel Jr. So uh, they've they've maybe learned that the you know you can have the pew pew pews and stuff blows up real good, but if you you make sure the fans are are, are getting their taste too beyond just the the mainstream folks, then maybe you can make a, a boatload of money. Did they de-age Mark Wahlberg in this one too? Or? <laughs> <laughs> Did you? I didn't see Marky Mark in the uh, in the in the, I the trailer. Was he either. in there? I didn't either. You know, the human characters are just like there <laughs> to give us something. You know, uh, human uh, pun intended to grab onto. Um, I think I think we just found a transformer. Yeah, they have that um, army guy that's always in the in those movies, right? Um, what's his name? And he was from a TV show. From, oh yeah, like wasn't he the guy or... from Vegas or something? Yeah, and, yeah. And Rise of the... Which one is it called? Which one is this? Is it Josh Dark Dumel? The is it Josh Dumel, or am I thinking of somebody else? Oh, Transfer Rise of the Beast is the one, yeah. right? And Tyrese and was in Dinklage a bunch of these too, it. wasn't he? Peter Dinklage is in it. That makes sense. Michelle Yeoh's in it. What? See, they're they're going. They're... Ron Perlman is the voice of Optimus Prime. Was he always the voice? He's the voice of Optimus Primal, right? Okay. Cause... Oh, wait, Primal. Okay. Yeah. Right. Oh, I, I missed the AL. Yes, you're right. Yeah. Um, you know, with all these trailers, I don't know if you all ever look at the the YouTube comments. And why would you? It's a it's a it's a rat's nest. It's it's, it's most cool. easily become internet, right? Um, but I can't help but yeah, Josh Dumel, yeah. I can't help but say that you know what the the box office impact of uh, Morbius is not great, but the the cultural meme impact is great. So. Here, there are people who say, I loved when Optimus said, it's prime in time, <laughs> just to <laughs> continue that stupid meme. <laughs> prime in time. It's not okay. Morbin time anymore. It's prime in time. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of in your camp, Jaime. I, uh, I, I don't know that I would watch this in the theater, although I'm sure it would be a deafening, metal-screeching experience. But, 
I did. I I think I was a young adult at the time uh, Beast Wars came out, and I did watch it, it and I was quite fond of it. Uh, I'm I'm kind of curious. I'm kind of curious to see live action uh, Beast Transformers. So I, I will definitely watch this in some form down the road. Although I, I can't imagine I would go see it in the theater, but uh, it does look like it'll blow up pretty good. Didn't you collect all those VHS shows back in the day? I did. I still have my VHSs of uh, Beast Wars somewhere in a box in my basement. I'm sure they're worth a lot of money as collectibles. <laughs> okay. Really? <laughs> no. 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 As a matter of fact, I think when I bought them, I was buying them for like two bucks a piece or something like that. So that's, mm, that's okay. Yeah. yeah. Just to watch them and yeah. yep. to have them, right? Well, yeah, again, they were going to, they were clearing out VHSs at that point. I was like, all right, mm-hmm, two bucks. It's free. It's two bucks for. You know, a night's entertainment. They can't go wrong. There was no Netflix, so. Right. right. That's true. All right. You were the Netflix. That's right. That's right. Uh, A couple of quick ones. So we got a confirmation of the release date for The Mandalorian. Mandalorian uh, Season 3 is coming on March 1st. Uh, You know, that's good that we're not having to wait too much longer. And that times out nicely because we're getting Bad Batch at the beginning of January. So I guess we'll go straight from Bad Batch Season 2 into Mandalorian Season 3. Good. The uh, that'll tide tide us over, yeah. Yeah, the Flash. They announced the final uh, the start date for the final season. There, you will be able to watch the uh, premiere of the final season on the CW in the United States on Wednesday, March. Uh, no, sorry, Wednesday, February eighth. Uh, in Canada, it's airing. I think still on Netflix. So we will get it. I'm thinking probably on the Fridays because that's how they foolishly roll. And uh, what else we got here? Oh. Hey, so later in this episode, we're going to talk a little bit about Willow, the new Willow series that's on Disney Plus. So this definitely caught my eye. Uh, so they had already said that Val Kilmer wouldn't be back for this uh, series on Disney Plus because it was being filmed during the uh, pandemic. And uh, as we've talked about on this show before, Val Kilmer had some serious health issues and they didn't think it was a good idea for him to go and and do this. So they've sort of uh, written around him in, in the first season, which we'll call it the first season, assuming that it goes well. But what they've said is that uh, if it is in fact going to be a multi-season story, that there is a possibility that he could come back. So Jonathan Kazan told uh, entertainment weekly, he's the showrunner. He said, you know, we had a we had a script. He was in it. We wanted really wanted him to come back. But unfortunately, it wasn't going to work. So they ended up writing around him. But what they said was, you know, if this is a hit, if it goes well, if people like it and we decide to do a second season that that's still on the table, that there is a way that we could bring him back in spite of obviously his uh, limitations, given he's, you know, uh, throat surgery and everything like that. So. The possibility exists that we could still get Mad Mardigan coming back in, uh, in a Willow if there's a season two. So now I am t- going to start a write-in campaign. Hopefully we can get, uh, get Kilmer back as Mad Mardigan. I loved uh, the, the character. Again, I, I get some people love Willow, some people don't. I loved it. You know, it, it is derivative. It is. It's basically it's, you know, uh, Lord of the Rings riff. It's a Star Wars it's riff. Princess Bride-ish. Yeah. As mm-hmm. well. Yeah. Although it's not as con- not as campy, though. Yeah. You know, if you if you break it down, it's like so, you know, it's about a farm boy and a scoundrel who go on an adventure to save a princess. I'm like, well, this sounds kind of familiar. Uh, oh, wait, yeah, Mario, Lucas, right? Well, yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I was always a fan of it. So I was excited that they were going to do more of it. But obviously, you know, there's only so much you can do given the ravages of time. And, you know, he was a huge part of that movie. You know, it. it, it I and we'll talk about it when we get into the episode, but he's missing. He's clearly missing from what we're watching right now, and it would yeah, be great well, if I mean, he was that's there. part of the part of the plot too, right? So yeah. So anyway, I'm excited about that. I I hope that that comes to pass. Well, his son sounds like 100 percent like him. Like I watched the, the the documentary he made about himself, like about his life and about how he mm-hmm. carried a video camera wherever he went. And you're watching this this show on Netflix, and you're like, he's talking about the fact that he can't talk and whatever and you're like why am i hearing your voice then and then he says this is my his son and i'm reading his his you know prose right Mm -hmm. right at the very beginning of the movie like you know probably like 10 minutes in so you're like wow that's amazing like you you wouldn't have known it wasn't val kilmer talking 
Yeah, and maybe there's a way to do that in on a show like Willow, where you know Val can mouth the words or or speak as best he can in the moment, and then they can use you know ADR and and do his son doing the lines afterwards, or you know use one of the computer programs that they've used to do you know James Earl Jones as Darth Vader or whatever. So you know, th- like I say, there's there is solutions for these things if they want it to happen. Uh, and and I hope they do because because he was great and, he, and he's in Ma- Top Maverick Top Gun Maverick or whatever Maverick Top Gun he's in that movie. Sorry, so. I've never heard of it. What's this? <laughs> <laughs> it's a movie about a train or something. It like can't stop and you know Maverick was like that a action. western with James uh, Garner? Yeah, and and Will Smith. Yeah, yeah. That's the one. <laughs> All right. Uh, last thing on my pile here was uh, was the news about Rings of Power season two. I like this one because I found it was really interesting. So they they have announced a new pile of of people joining the cast for season two. Whatever. But they announced that the actor who played Adar uh, was going to be recast. So. Joseph Maule is the the person who played him in the first season, and I think we could probably agree played him quite well. He was a very interesting yeah. character and, mm-hmm. and very you know um, yeah just kept us, kept kept things very interesting. Uh, he's being replaced for season two by an actor named Sam Hazeldean, who was on Peaky Blinders. This came out as sort of a story, but then it sort of got another, like, once everybody got a hold of it, there was all the conspiracy that was just like, well, why, 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 And so far, I have not seen a satisfying answer on why he has, he, like, it's not like that, oh, you know, he had another opportunity, he's going to go be the lead in another show, or like, I, I still have not found a satisfying answer for why he's not back. I, I, do you guys have any sense of how or why or what what's going on here? No, I have no clue. No, this is news to me. Yeah, as if you just rolled it up. Yeah. No, no hint of, but for that I'm aware of, of like um, some juicy new role it could be in that's a little bit more major or about to get canceled or something. Like I have no idea what what would cause the change. Uh, health concerns, I suppose, could be another one. I haven't heard any any reason yeah. uh, why the person was changed. Yeah, it's just so it's so wild, and especially because it was kind of a breakout role. I mean, yeah, obviously, Joseph Malloy has been in other things. He was in Game of Thrones. He's been in other things, but uh, that was the first time where I was like, "Wow, this guy's really, really good." He has some some great monologues in in season one, and he's you know he's got a real sort of presence on the screen. They did a good job. Obviously, the production value is very high, so he looks great in all his scenes. But I was really surprised to, to see that not only was he not going to be back, given that he was sort of a breakout in season one, but also that, you know, uh, that there's no real answer. It's just like, yeah, no, he's just, yeah, <laughs> he's just not coming back. Like, what? So we'll keep our ears peeled and, and see if we can find out more as it as it continues to unfold. And he, he released a statement and the producers released a statement and everybody was like, you know, there didn't seem to be any acrimony or anything. He was like, this was a great opportunity. I had a blast playing this character. I'm so grateful and so honored to have been part of it. And they were like, he was great. We loved working with them, blah, blah, blah. But again, nothing from there. So I keep waiting for the shoe to drop where they're like, going to be a new Netflix series. Here's the star. Like something else has got to be happening, right? Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, basically body shape, he looks very similar to the current actor. And I guess, you know, they had a lot of prosthetics on his face and stuff. But yeah, I don't know. It's. And the weird, weird part about it is that you put something like that in, if you've seen shows, like he's in, he's in Slow, Horse, Slow Horses and he's also in, as you mentioned, Peaky Blinders, although a smaller role, like he's not mm. one of the main characters in that, right? So, um, you know, the question is, will you be looking at Adar or will you be looking at this guy playing Adar, you know, kind of, because like this, the clear, like you said, the, the original actor, he owned that role, right? Joseph Mal, Malway. Yeah. Mal? Molly? Mal? Molly? Joseph Molly? Molly? Mal? Yeah. Mal? I don't know. Next week's fact check. How to say this guy's name. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah, forget about him. He's not in the show anymore. There you go. Do another genre show. We'll learn your name. All right. So I got a couple of things. One is I see, I called it. Um, <laughs> the owner of the house of, of the Christmas story house goes off on actor for posing for photos with fans. Apparently one of the people who's in the current iteration, I think he was a, one of the characters growing up was taking selfies out in front of his house. And I've got a clip here of, uh, yeah, the owner basically just came out and said, you know, get the hell off my property and who the heck are you and all that kind of stuff. And and it kind of made the rounds a little, went, went minorly viral for a bit. So 
Yeah, and I think you. We were. I was saying to you last week, if you bought the house, then you know, you'd yell at people for taking selfies in front of the house, right? There you go. But if you buy a famous house, don't you understand in the moment when you're buying the house that that's part of the deal? You would hope. You would hope. But who knows what that real estate agent told this guy, right? If it, I mean, do you think it had cachet because it was the Christmas Story house when he bought it 10 yeah. years ago or whenever he bought it? A 100% yeah. yes. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody mm-hmm. who owns a famous house, you know, the, I think we talked about it in a uh, previous episode, but like, I think the... The house that the Brady Bunch facade that the, the, they use for the exteriors for the Brady Bunch yeah, yeah, is in yeah. like the it's in the valley in in Los Angeles and yeah like you know what you're getting oh, yourself the, into if you buy that house you know people are going to stop by and want to take a picture in your front lawn and if you're not okay with that don't buy that house yeah you know that you know that the Property Brothers brought the cast from the Brady Bunch back and they re, they bought that house and and re renoed it yeah to make it look like the brady bunch house as you anyway, would as you would yeah so this is in chicago this house where is it it's cleveland isn't it i thought it was cleveland i thought chicago was where the oh the is that actually where the actual guy. house is I... well no i just started taking i started taking um I, I started watching a little bit of it yesterday but i wasn't really ready to get into the, the ralphie you know 2020 story or 2020 yeah, story. Yeah, it's kicked off the property so, in Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland, okay, okay. I was mm-hmm. going to say, if it was in Chicago, I would have gone and done a selfie in front of it for you guys. <laughs> yeah, no, I remember because I was in Cleveland a few years back. We went on a little baseball road trip where we went down to, uh, it was smaller ones. We just did Cleveland and then uh, Detroit and then back. And when we were in Cleveland, like you could, people advertised it, right? Like you knew where it was. It, it was right, a landmark, right? right? So, I don't know, maybe previous owners had had a little more of an inclusive, you know, no, you know, come on down and no big deal. And this uh, new owner is not feeling that way. But yeah, it's just, it's kind of, to me, it seems a little short-sighted. If you, if you buy a famous piece of property, chances are people are going to want to see said property. And nowadays people are going to want to take a picture outside that property. So I don't know. It doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Well. Apparently, the actor who was standing in front of the house, Brian, Brian Jones is the owner of the house. And, uh, yeah, the actor, uh, Yano Anaya, is no longer welcome at the house, whoever he is, right? Yeah. No clue. Anyway, uh, that's exciting news. Uh, the, other, the other piece I have here is for, is for you guys. I don't know if you've heard of this service called Twitter. You heard of Twitter? It's pretty pretty new out there, I think. I think the people used uh, anyway, to do that back in the early 2000s. What, Twitter? <laughs> yeah. yeah, something <laughs> like that. Something like that. Anyway, or mid, late 2000s, I think, mm, actually. Mm. But uh, so uh, interesting here. Somebody posted a timeline of the movies that James Cameron, Jim Cameron, he's calling him here in the actual thing here, but uh, very disrespectful of our Canadian native brother. Um, all the movies he's done. So, you know, like he started in 19, what, 82. He did Piranha 2. He did Terminator and, and then Aliens, and then there's a bit of a gap, Abyss, and then Terminator, and then True Lies and Titanic, and then there's a big gap of like ten years to Avatar, mm-hmm. and, and then another ten twelve years. years, yeah, exactly, ten, twelve, thirteen years to Avatar two. So kind of an interesting jump there. Yeah, I guess he's been preoccupied. Oh, he was wasn't he like refloating the Titanic or something like that? No, oh, well, you know, he was exploring the ocean bottom for a while there. Yeah, cause he, because we bought too many movie tickets or whatever. <laughs> yes, that's what we did. <laughs> anyway, it's all our fault for buying movie tickets to empower this guy. Uh, all right, well, we're at this part of the show where we talk about something related to Star Trek. This week, we're talking about Star Trek Prodigy. And since we missed last week, we're going to do two episodes. Uh, we're going to talk about Preludes, Season 1, Episode 16, I think. I don't know, I could be wrong. I will correct me, I'm sure. Oh, hang on, my computer's gone bananas and then um then we're also going to talk about um 17 ghost in the machine ghost in the machine the ghost in the machine like yeah they didn't steal that name from somewhere yep and as usual my dog wants to go visit the outdoors so i'm going to hand it off to you guys to (laughs) start the show all right uh so elevator pitch jaime what have you got mine was just a title so it is uh Star Trek colon prodigy colon origins is what I went with as the the most succinct way of describing this episode. Yep. 
Yeah, I, I had to, you know, same sort of explanatory repair time on the Protostar leads to origin stories for many of our key, key players and their nemesis. So we actually get uh, the Diviner's origin mixed in there as well. It, um, yeah, it was, you know, it was that sort of stereotypical, you know, flashback episode, right? Where they're like, how did you get to where we met you 15 episodes ago? Oh, it's a great story. Let me tell you. Uh, what, uh, which of the stories caught your, caught your ears or caught your eyes? Which one did you like the best? It seemed kind of interesting to me that, uh, Rock Talk, Mm. who's, who's like, well, for one, her story was essentially like Thor Ragnarok. She was like the Hulk character. They even have them kind of dressed a bit like Thor and the Hulk. Um, and it, it seems to kind of explain why she as a character, despite her, her bulk and powerful physical size doesn't really seem to enjoy combat all that much because she, you know, kind of had to do it as a, as a, as a fake thing, but then it got kind of dark for her. Yeah. So that, that was the one that sort of resonated with me on that. Yeah. I, uh, I found myself watching this, uh, her story and it's funny because we, we establish in the first episode, right. When, um, Dal's talking to her, and before they have the universal translators, all he hears is these like monstrous growls, and, and you know she she sounds ferocious, right? And then of course, once they get the translators, you hear she sounds like a little girl. It, it was the first time since those initial episodes where we actually heard her as the sort of bellowing monster again, and I thought that was uh, yeah, it was interesting to sort of see her back in that that sort of mode, but. Uh, yeah, that was a that was a sad story. And again, she kept talking about like, oh, and I, if I did a good job, I got this big bowl of Nutra goop. And then, you know, of course, she's tired of being the monster and she decides to flip the script and they're like, no more Nutra goop for you. You're getting sold into slavery. Like, oh, geez, that got dark fast. I thought the the zero story was pretty uh, affecting, too, because, you know, Zero's talking about how, you know, yeah, we, you know, transcended physical form. We're these beautiful beings of energy and light and we floated through the galaxy together exploring until the Kazon showed up and (laughs) stuck me in a box and sold me into slavery like whoa again very dark the um yeah this one was a i don't know i mean i think i get why they did this obviously it's good to sort of you know get these story stories out of the way but it was kind of uh a lot and it would have been nice if they'd given each of the episodes, each of the characters a little, a little more breathing room for this stuff. Even the Jenkum Pog one, which was pretty funny, where, you know, Jenkum's up aboard the Tellarite ship and he accidentally gets woken up and then he has to fix everything. And then in the end, he wants to go back to bed and he can't because he's used up too much air. And he's like, OK, I guess I'll leave. And immediately gets, you know, taken prisoner and made his slave. I'm like, again, mm-hmm. very dark, very funny, but then very dark. But it just felt like there wasn't enough time to really sink your teeth into some of these stories. It was really like, you know, two minutes per person and off we go, right? Yeah, it was um, proposed somewhere on the internet, and I haven't double-checked to see if this is true, but somebody said, oh, um, maybe the reason that Jankum Pog says his name in the third person is derived from this experience where the machine said, state your name, and then your query. So he always says, Jankum Pog, blah, right. blah, blah. I was like, oh, that's <laughs> actually not bad. I didn't pay attention to that part of the episode. Did he did he state his name regularly before he had that wild encounter with the, the maintenance robot? Yeah, really? Well, we, we haven't seen too much of him before then. So, yeah. Uh, I don't remember Tellarites in, in the show. Are they? But I mean, there was the Tellarites in, in the, the original series when they were, they were fighting each other and the Andorian guy kills one of them or yep. something like that, right? Yeah, they're sort of portrayed as you know, piggish sort of fangs and tusks and fur in the original series. And I think they've been like background characters and other Star Trek things over the years, but not really focused. Um, but yeah, it was, um, it was good. I thought it was funny that they like, you know, now Murph is, is a, a biped and I was, you know, they're like, Hey Murph, what's your story? And he like belches. I'm like, mm, is that, you know, I still feel like there's another shoe to drop on Murph. Like there's, there's more to the evolution of Murph coming. True. Yeah. Yeah. I like them better as a blob, but we'll, we'll have to see where they go with this. Right. I concur. And, and especially we'll, we'll talk about the next episode, but uh, yeah, I liked them better as a, as a, like a g- giggling blob of stuff that, you know, got into misadventures. Uh, Easter egg. I had uh, Molly at the very end of the episode. Janeway is telling 
Hollow Janeway is telling Janeway's story and starts talking about Molly, which of course is her dog um, from from Voyager. For for those that remember, um, mm-hmm. you know she she has to leave her dog she behind. Had a dog with her. on Voyager. Well, in the very first episode, she leaves uh, Molly with her boyfriend or partner Mark. Right? Is it Mark? Like Mark, Mark. Yeah, he might have been fiance. I can't remember. But yeah, like, at the very least, long time partner of some sort. Yeah, I think they were supposed to be, you know, like a long term couple. But um, yeah, Molly stays there, and then when they eventually reconnect with the the communications with the Alpha Quadrant uh, and sees Mark, he talks about Molly having puppies and stuff. So uh, yeah, that, that was sort of the, the the Easter egg for the you know long time Star Trek fans in there was when you know she starts bringing up Molly because uh, that it's. <laughs> I saw my son this morning, and he's he. We had to watch this the last couple episodes separately just because of timing. And he said, "I have a question for you: Who or what is Molly?" I'm like, "Okay, there we go." So yeah, it was a it was a you know for non long time Star Trek yeah. fans, it is a bit of an obscure reference. Sure. Anything else catch your eyes? No, but I'm looking at your quote here about percussive maintenance. That's, that's pretty much what you know, whacking something on the side of it to make it work. That's what we used to fix TVs back in the day. Oh yeah. I thought that that line made me laugh. So it, it was when Jenkins trying to fix everything aboard the ship, and uh, he's, he's it was on the first part. Where he's trying to fix stuff on the protostar, and he gives it a good whack with the thing and says, "Progressive maintenance. What do you know?" Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, that's. I think uh, I practice percussive maintenance. Should be on a T-shirt somewhere. Yeah. Well, we used to have to whack our TVs because I think it would jostle the tubes and reseat them, kind of thing, or settle them, or whatever. Yeah. Make the connection. Yeah. Yeah. And so. The the two things that I guess we get in this episode that are sort of not just backstory, but character development going forward. So we get the diviner story, the diviner story. They talk about, you know, the timey wimey of it all, how, you know, they all went back. So we get uh, how Essentia ended up there as well. Uh, or what does she say her name is? She's not, a, she's not Essentia. She's, um, is a new name. What's her new she's name? She's the something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wrote it down. Yeah. Damn, did I write it down? Okay, so that was from that episode where the, the two of them, she's telling her the origin story, and then Janeway, Captain Janeway says, where's oh, the Vindicator, name? the Vindicator. Vindicator, yeah, they all had some sort of the name. Yes, and... I wonder if the Edge from U2 is one of them. Yeah, no kidding. And uh, so we get, yeah, a little bit of the backstory of how she's there and how he's there and how they're, they're different ages, even though, because it's, because he's been in the past longer than she was, because she arrived at a different time, because they took different paths in space-time. And then at the end of the episode, Jamie starts to put together like, well, you know, hey, maybe the protostar crew are not the bad guys. Maybe we need to talk to this diviner character and goes downstairs and ends up getting like kabonged. Right. So uh, that's they sort of leave us with, you know, Jamie on the floor and, you know, the diviner and the vindicator and uh, Dreadnought sort of standing there going, wah, ha, 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 ha. Which leads us into this week's episode, which is uh, episode 17, Ghost in the Machine, which doesn't pick up from there, nor does it reference it at all. No, true. And and they're still stuck in in the neutral neutral zone, zone, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a fake out at the beginning that they make it seem like, oh, this imminent stuff happened and they're getting wrecked by the the Dauntless, right? Yeah. Just the the simulation for the holodeck. Yeah, and it's them practicing for their trying to get the message to them by firing the lasers over the Dauntless to try and use Morse code. Yes, that's the way to go. Fire the lasers Mm. at them. (laughs) Uh, My elevator pitch for this one was uh, going back to our theme of of Star Trek 101 for this one for for Starter Trek is Holodeck 101. All holodecks suck and eventually the safeties will be off and that's how the protostar learned this one the hard way. Like, they had to show you that this is how a holodeck works. This is what happens inside a holodeck. Inevitably, the safeties get turned off, and then somebody's going to beat the tar out of you. And if you're really unlucky, someone's going to get shot. Yeah, yeah. I made you. Yeah, have my a... my. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. My elevator. So my elevator pictures never share your password, especially with an AI. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my my elevator pitch uh, going along with the same theme of, again, this is a, a Nickelodeon show. You're meant to be a parent watching with your child, and it's their introduction, uh, Fisher-Price style, to the Star Trek world, right? Even though it's got these weird, dark themes that we've mentioned. So I went with my first time trapped on the holodeck, because 
It's like you gotta you gotta start them young. And be like this will be in every Star Trek ep- uh, show. So just just learn what the the tropes are here. Yeah, yeah. The, the golden book stuck on the holodeck. Yeah, and, 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 and is that a real gun? Like it just inevitably, yeah. they're like, "Huh, it's okay." We're not, you know, when Jenkum Pog is fighting the Tellarites, and he's like, "It's okay, I come in all the time. You can't possibly get hurt." I'm like, "Why would you? Why would you in any world ever say that line? Like, you can't possibly get yeah. hurt in here." Yeah, and immediately yeah. he gets punched like a half a city block. Like, okay. Uh, that was my best pew pew pew. Was the was the Tellerite fight where they they take on the Tellerite gang in the in the alleyway? I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, they all mm-hmm, sort of throw mm-hmm. down with the Tellerites. Big giant os- octopusy thing is sort of that was funny too. The uh, yeah. glitter smooch, glitter smooch, yeah. glitter smooch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when she comes back as like a sea monster, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, for the Easter egg, I could not help but I wrote it down as GB six four N three two X. To me, that was uh, Game Boy, N64, and 32X, which is the Sega system. Uh, oh, really? That, that's where my mind went. I did a, just a quick search before we went on to see if I was on the right track. And there was like, you know, 20 different message boards where people were like, I'm pretty sure it's Game Boy, N64, and 32X. I'm like, there you go. All right. Yeah. So, yeah, cool. it's a bit of an obscure thing to include in a Star Trek. Oh, that's the password. Oh, that's the okay, password right. that, yeah, that, yeah. Uh, yeah. that Dal yells out. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Pretty, pretty easy to figure that one out. I guess he wouldn't use that. And don't use that password. That would be another advice to people. <laughs> don't share your password and don't use and that Don't use Dal's password. password. That's, 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 it's yeah. too easy to figure out. Exactly. Yeah. No. yeah. Um, so, of course, the, the twist in this one is that, uh, you know, they're stuck in the holodeck for this whole mission. And in the end, you know, Zero helps them piece it together. And it's an escape room episode. Yeah, pretty much. And turns out that uh, that hollow Janeway had accidentally stuck them in there or inadvertently in their own mind so is is hollow janeway still on their side is this all is she has she been pulling weird strings this whole time what are we supposed to take away from all this yeah i don't know that was my big question it's it's an interesting theory yeah because they say at one point you know well did she you know uh why you know why has she why is she just sort of turning her you know turning evil now and they're like well because before we were trying to do the same thing she was which was get to the federation get to starfleet and now we're trying to do something else and so she's trying to get us back to doing that thing right so it's that it's that 2001 space odyssey again Mm -hmm. um movie i mean the, the the story in that one is that the ai is controlling the ship right and mm-hmm. for those of you who spoilers who haven't seen it or don't haven't figured it out right what happens is you know it's it's not programmed to lie or whatever and it's given a secret instruction no matter what happens with the human crew you must complete the mission mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and that's what sets hal off it's not that hal by by his very nature i mean back in the, in the 70s everybody was suspicious of computers anyway right so um, cause that's just the way it was back then, but you know, kind of how they are about, you know, strange reality TVs running countries and stuff. But, um, the, so, so that's this, this story, basically that Janeway has been given this task of making sure the protostar gets back to the Federation, probably by the people who have, you know, put this, uh, I forget the name of the device that's going to infect the Federation when they connect to them. Right. Um, that to me is, is the, uh, you know, the sort of mega virus thing that they've got planted in there. And, and I guess I just I'm thinking about that. If it destroyed the star base, why wouldn't it then jump over the Federation's network and destroy the rest of the Federation? Yeah, mm-hmm. I think there was something in that episode of being like it needed a certain amount of time to be able to upload or something and it didn't have enough time. Mm-hmm. OK, all right. But um, yeah, so, th- so this is that same trope over again that, you know, basically the, the AI has this secret instruction that's going to override all the sort of safety protocols if you want to call it that right you know yeah yeah i was uh i could not help but think at the end of this episode so are they saving a spot in the lower decks vault for you know crazed uh ai for hollow janeway now she gets to sit beside mm, the other characters yeah. that they've encountered uh over the last few seasons <laughs> yeah it, it could be a, a thing and i can practically hear the mariner quips about uh, the holloway <laughs> holloway uh 
best quote. There was a couple of good ones. Jankum, when uh, he's using uh, ice cream as the salve for the emotional damage. Sounds like you just earned yourself two more scoops of sadness. Yeah. yeah. Yes, to which they all say, pile it on, pile it on. Pile it on. Uh, I also liked Gwyn's inadvertent, let's pop this blow stand. Uh, that was, a, that was a, a good one. Yeah. Don't think that's how it goes. Yeah, pile it on. Yeah. Um, I don't know. What, uh, so we, you know, back-to-back episodes, we're obviously covering sort of, you know, two birds with one stone here. You know, so plot advancement is... Janeway's hollow Janeway's turned against them. Real Janeway's unconscious. The diviner remembers who he is, and we've got three episodes to go. Yeah, and hmm. it looks like the final episode is like a two part. You know, it's going to end on a cliffhanger, and and yeah, so it's going to be so good. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I mean, it's kind of like you know the mid season break too was almost like to me that was almost like a season ender because it, they yeah. they end up you know stuck in their. They, have got, I mean, it was a good place to break the season up into two pieces, right? Because um, it did sort of definitely have a, a cliffhanger-y kind of plot line. So be interesting to see. Do you think do you think this show will come back? And do you think it's got enough legs to justify coming back? Or is it just because it's got Star Trek on it, it's, it's going to win? Or That's a great question. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what a satisfying performance for this is. It's so different than than other Trek. It's as different in its own way as Lower Decks was, right? You know, they, they really are sort of aiming for different audiences with these these different shows. I don't know if a success for this is, you know, well, we used it as Starter Trek, it's got 20 episodes and we're done, if it didn't meet certain metrics, or if they were like, we need to keep building on a foundation of teaching people about Star Trek to start building for the next generation, pardon the pun. Do you think that's the purpose of this show? A hundred percent. There's no question in my yeah. mind. I mean, we joke about it all the time, Starter Trek and Star Trek 101, but that's exactly what this show is meant to be. It's meant to be, I think, Jaime, you, you mentioned it in previous episodes quite quite eloquently. It, it, it's really, it's meant to be something where mom and dad who are Trekkies can sit down with their kids and put on something that's Trek that is not, you know, super intense or in kids' minds, super boring, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm. I'm I'm kind of curious what they'll make of it. Um, I I don't think they're gonna wrap stuff up in like three episodes. So I'm guessing it's planning for a season two. I don't recall what the the order history was. Mm. I I don't imagine they can wrap up like finding Chakotay, defeating the Diviner, you know, the Protostar, and you know, connecting with the Fetish in three episodes. That seems like too much of an ask. I, I suspect at minimum we're gonna get one more season. It's that, or again, Fisher Price style. It's going to be, you know, my first hold my beer. <laughs> you say, oh no, <laughs> they're teaching the kids that, like, hey, sometimes they have to wrap it all up in this, like, really kind of quick and slapdash sort of way. Well, you know, Jaime, it's Christmas time, so I believe it's ho ho hold my beer. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, it, uh, yeah. I don't know. It, it, it seems like a big ask. And, you know, They've got they've got toys to sell. They've got you know they they want kids to to invest in this stuff. I, I I'd be surprised if we didn't get at least one more season out of this. All right. Well, let's move on to Willow. Willow. The Return of Willow. Yes. Yeah. So you can jump in with the Gales, which is the starting of you know picking up where Queen Queen Sorcerer is now the Queen. Hmm. Right. And her her daughter and a future knight are you know practicing together mm-hmm. so so i have a question so without getting too far into it did you recognize or do you have a theory on who um alora Dannon was from the get-go like from from the introduction of the first sort of three female characters no no that one i was i i figured it out later in the episode but right off the jump i and i think they did it obviously deliberately but the actress who plays jade has yeah. red curly hair and is friends with the princess. And I think that was supposed to be the red herring, right? Where you're supposed to look at that. You're supposed to remember that Alora Dannon had, you know, curly red hair and you're supposed to think, Oh, clearly hiding in plain sight. Jade must be that. Plus uh, I, I meant to write down her name. Uh, somebody can look, look that up while I chat, but um, the actress who plays Jade 
is also one of the better known faces from the show. She was in uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. She was the main antagonist in that. She was also in uh, Solo, a Star Wars story. She was Emphy Ness in that. The the masked sort of uh, freedom fighter that that Solo encounters at the near the end. So you know she she is somebody who you're supposed to recognize when you see her face and she's got those you know the great curls and the freckles and stuff. You're supposed to immediately know her face and you're supposed to think, oh well, that's clearly going to be. Alora Dan, and so that when eventually they do the switch later in the episode, you are like, oh, there is that. Uh, but it didn't occur to me that who Alora Dan was until later in the episode when that character is sort of stubbornly like, I've got this, I'm going, and just sort of sets off on her own. I was like, oh, there's no way that that she's what she appears to be if this is the attitude that she has, right? Yeah, bakery, bakery woman. Yeah, yeah muffin yeah. girl, right? Yeah, Aaron, yeah, so. Yeah, Aaron Kellyman is the name of Kelly, the... Kellyman, that's it. I was trying, right trying to remember. I knew it was something uh, something long, but she, and she's great. Again, she was she was great Winter Soldier. She was in Falcon the Winter Soldier. She was, you know, she's she's definitely a talented actor. And like I said, she was, I think she was deliberately put in in our way so that we don't pick up on the, the twist that comes at the end of the episode. Mm-hmm. And Ellie Bamber plays Alora Dana. Yes, yes. Completion. Yeah. So this was um, okay. So let me let me start back at the beginning. How much Willow had you seen, and did you rewatch the movie before you watched this? I I think I watched Willow when it came on to Disney um, Plus uh, a few months ago, like uh, six months ago or so. So I, I was, and I'd seen it probably two or three times before that. Right. So right. How about you, Jaime? I, I'm I'm wondering why Kevin Pollock's not in this this show. Oh, he'll be there. Way. He'll be there. I watched this movie, you know, back in its heyday on VHS, you know, where mm-hmm. it got you know popular because it wasn't that uh, great of a movie in the blockbuster sort of sense uh, in the theaters. Mm-hmm. Um, I I didn't rewatch the movie, but I did find an 11 minute recap of uh, of it on YouTube to get like, okay, all right, I, I get the basic plot of you know hero's journey type stuff. Yep. Uh, Willow Willow is like. Bilbo, Frodo Baggins, Luke Skywalker, and yep. he wants to train, and, and now here he's, he is kind of uh, Luke Skywalker, which we'll, we'll oh, get to. Or, or he's Obi Wan Kenobi, depending on your perspective. Yeah, it really, it really depends. They 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 play him a little differently than um than than we might we might think. Um, so I I um I didn't go through the effort of of watching the movie before, but I was like, okay, yeah, the the, the plot makes sense in this recap that it is. Uh, very similar to Lord of the Rings in a lot of respects. Um, mm-hmm. And you, you get the major beats of, uh, you know, learning to be a wizard, uh, a sorcerer. You, uh, you learn about, like, why Bav Morda wants to to banish Elora and ends up getting banished herself, which they actually mm-hmm. recap that part from the movie in the, mm-hmm. like, the, the, the previously segment on Disney+. Plus. It's about where I was at coming into it. Yeah, so I was... a fan from back in the day it had always been a movie that struck a chord with me and and i did enjoy it very much in its time i did make a point of watching it a few weeks ago just so that it would be fresher in my mind and you know it it has its problems certainly it's not a perfect movie it's you know it's definitely in a spot where if george lucas wanted to go back and touch up some of those effects it wouldn't hurt it there's, there's a few spots that are a little rough they're a little rough but you know if you're okay with understanding its context, then it's fine. But I, I was coming into it with the mindset of, I wonder who this is for. Like, are they trying to build a new generation? Are they playing on nostalgia? Like, what angle are they going to take? And they kind of jumped right into it. And I don't know. I'm still, like, we're three episodes in, and we're going to talk about the other episodes. But I found myself, even watching the first one, where, you know, they sort of, we jump in with Queen Sorsha. And, you know, we're at Tira's lean and okay. And, you know, here's the characters and they're sort of running through it. And then all of a sudden these mysterious bad guys show up who, you know, obviously we learn are the Gales and they've got these different powers and they're doing this stuff. And you just find yourself being like, there's a lot of stuff happening in here without a lot of context in a show called Willow, where we haven't met anyone named Willow. I felt like it was just maybe a little into the deep end right off the top, but enjoyable. Like, I, I wasn't like, anything's missing or this is terrible. I just found, like, if if I was coming into this and not a fan of Willow, which I am, like, I was able to obviously follow along. I enjoyed it. 
but I found myself trying to put on a more objective hat thinking like if I set this down and watch this with, you know, somebody who was not feeling as wistful and nostalgic for, for, you know, for Warwick Davis and Willow and, and all this whole world, what would they think of it? And I was like, eh, yeah, okay, sh- sure. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I found the first episode a little, a little bit hard to get into all things being equal. It was not uh, having seen now episodes two and three as well. Two, episode one was a little, a little bit heavy for me as far as just introducing a bunch of characters, a bunch of places, a bunch of names, and then sort of casually dropping, you know, all this stuff about, you know, this even larger than Bath Morda thing. Like we were all supposed to have known that, that no reference to it in the original movie, no, no evil bigger than we need to save Alora Dannon and, and stop Queen Bev Morda. That was, yeah, it was the evil queen story, right? Yeah, like sure. The, you know, the, Absolutely. Yeah. The, the young, the young apprentice magician and, and the evil queen. And yeah. once we defeat the evil, evil queen, huzzah, we all live happily ever after. Yeah. Right? And so we come into this one where everyone's like, everyone knows there's this even more evil and everyone knows this. And I, I don't know. I always, I, I never a huge fan of that. Like, well, it's always been this way. We just never talked about it. I, I always have struggle with that one a little bit. Um, but I did enjoy, you know, the way they introduced the characters. We get to meet Kit and Jade, who are, you know, clearly very close. And then obviously later on, we see them uh, share a kiss. So we know that there's, you know, maybe something more in there. But then they kind of can fuddle that a little bit by uh, having... Also, the announcement that Kit is marrying Graydon, Prince Graydon, who shows up. And, you know, we get to meet Eric. Of course, Eric is named after Mad Mardigan's friend for, who dies at, at the in the battle to stop Bev Morda at the end of the first movie. Mm-hmm. And, you know, of course, he seems like a, a bit of a, like his dad, a bit of a, a player and a scoundrel. And, you know, he's got this this, you know, lovely girl who works in the kitchen who's, you know... He seems to be in love with and who she, she seems to be in love with him. But then there's also, you know, is he is he earnest? Is he that, you know, is he into her? Is he just, you know, looking for his latest conquest? And and yeah, and then it sort of turns into this all of a sudden from from the darkness, all these things come and attack. And, you know, all these people are sort of thrust together and Eric is kidnapped. And all of a sudden the, the game is on. Right. It, then it's OK. Let's, you know. Let's gather up the fellowship. We'll get some tall people. We'll get some short people. We'll go off and we'll we'll sort of do this thing together. And it just sort of gets going, right? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. What uh, I don't know. What, what, what were your impressions? Do you guys did you did you find it you know e- easy to follow? Understood sort of where we are and the stakes and all that stuff right off the hop, or was it, I? I don't know. Like I said, I found it a little bit like they were making assumptions on our behalf. Was was just my impression. Yeah, I mean it's it's a bit like I, the reason I said Princess Bride was even even during the big battle scenes like in in today's episode, you know the music is still sort of light and adventury and you know um, yeah you know reminds me of that that uh, you know the music from the Holy Grail where the guys are running across the field and you got that you know epic yeah you know English movie music just playing over and over again as the guy runs a never ending run but. <laughs> And it kind of, it kind of, that's when it kind of struck me that it was a bit, a bit like Princess Bride in that sense, you know, in terms of like tongue firmly, not, you know, that was more of a, a tongue firmly planted in cheek, but it had that, and that was a Rob Reiner movie, right? Yeah. yeah. So it had that sort of, um, that, you know, wispy light feel to it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, even though there's some pretty dark stuff and, and it did, they did the sort of, maybe the beginning might've been a bit of a fooling and maybe that was telegraphing what was going to happen later when... Uh, they do find they go to where Willows lives, and um, they have uh, the other guy pretending to be Willow. Right? Yeah, yeah, Silas, uh, yeah, his friend. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, you and I both knew it wasn't Willow because it was obviously yeah, not, it's not Warren you know, Davis. Yeah, or, yeah. But um, and maybe that was telegraphing the the hey, there's going to be a switch later on. We probably should have caught that then. Um, I'm surprised, Jonathan, you you didn't catch that. But um, <laughs> the. Uh, and I like the I like the fact that they brought back the little kid, uh, the the daughter, right? Oh, Mims, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't know if it was a, it was a different actress, different actress, but she was quite good. Yeah, yep. yeah. But um, yeah, because I I did like the uh, you know I I like the two little characters, the two little kids that find uh, Lord Dannon in the first movie, mm-hmm. kind of thing, you know. Mm-hmm. And the way they call their dad, um, dad, dad, right? Or what do they call him? Yeah, da or dada. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, so, which is very Scottish English yep. sort of thing, but, um, you know, so it, it, it's interesting. I, I don't know if it, um, I don't know if, again, if it, like you said, it, if it stands alone as a great series, if you've never been a fan of the original one or even saw the original one, right? So, mm-hmm. um, so I mean, and that's the trouble with coming back 20 years later and doing a, a, a second series, right? Um Mind you, they've got the, the answer is the answer to is closer to thirty five. Actually, it's it's been a is while. It? Yeah, yeah, well, you know what I mean. Like it's been a while. So, like, yeah, you know, I, I, I mind you, I guess it's better than them retelling. I, I hate that when oh. they go back and they take something classic and redo it. You know? Oh, you mean like, like the Force Awakens, third trilogy? Of... Force Awakens, yeah, exactly. Or... Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. No, for me, the the giveaway on on um, Alora's identity was. First, when she's like, you know, when they're like, oh, she's run away, she's gone, she's gone to go look for the prince. I was like, well, again, that was a, a big tip. But the the absolute clincher was when she just walks through the the barrier. You're not allowed to walk through yeah. the barrier. You have mm-hmm. to go through the mother's gate. When she oh, walks through right, the barrier, yeah. I was like, 100%, that's a Lord Denon. There's no question in my mind. Because, <laughs> yeah, they make a point of saying, like, you have to go around. You have to go through this one one way in, one way out place. And as soon as she like just puts her hand up against it and walks through the gate, I was like, "Well, there you go." Mm, right. But um, but yeah, it's just it, it, that it, I, I had to flag the poor red shirt guy that they sent with them on that fellowship. <laughs> where they're like, I knew he, when he made his Samuel L. Jackson oh, um, man. deep blue sea speech. I'm like, that dude is dead. <laughs> Watch something hit him right now, and sure enough, he gets an 100%, arrow. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Um, yeah, it's like, we'll send Kit and Jade and Graydon and Borman and, sorry, what was your name again? Oh, it's Case. So I wrote in my notes, well, I guess Case closed. It's, uh, (laughs) just, you know, this poor, he's like, yeah, we need some leadership and an old guy. Let's send him along. Like, this guy has no chance. Oh, man, this is going to end badly. And yeah, sure enough, he's, he's toasted in the first episode. That was pretty funny. Uh, when they finally do find Willow and Willow just starts like launching, he's like, oh, Eric is a prisoner of the withered crone who dwells in the immemorial city behind the beyond the shattered sea. I'm like, those are just a bunch of words stuck together. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Like, all right. You know, and, and, you know, we're now we're three episodes in and we still don't have any idea what those words mean together. True. Yeah. And uh, so, and, and, you know, the, the, the character who plays, um, he's from the Wes Anderson movies, Tony Rivioroli. Uh, oh yeah. Rivioroli. He's the, he was in the Spider-Man movies too, right? He was Flash, Flash Thompson in the Spider-Man movies. Yeah. But, but like, doesn't look anything like his father. No. And doesn't look like anything like anybody else in this world of whitewashed, you well, know. No, Borman. People. Borman's also, uh, an Indian man, right? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Sort of Muslim looking dude. Yeah. Yeah. But um, no, no offense to, you know, whatever. But um, yeah, he just to me, just he's, you know, just looks South Asian to me or is he Mexican or something or Italian? I don't know what he what his heritage is, but yeah, I, 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 he's from Anaheim, California. There you go. Yeah, exactly right. American, <laughs> North, North American. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I think like on, in all things, you know, if you go back and watch Willow and then you watch this one, you're like, well, where were all the black and brown people in that first part? Like, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's good. It's welcome. Like, yes, please give me more diversity. Give me more faces that people can recognize and, and, and feel a part, a part of and ownership in and everything else. Like, in all things, in all things, fantasy needs to be diverse. You know, I felt that way about the Lord of the Rings power, uh, rings of power, right? Like, Oh my god, I can't believe there's all those black dwarves. Like, yeah, there always should have been black dwarves. This is stupid. Stop it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, more of everybody's everything, please. And it Wait, Annabelle Davis, is she related to Warwick? Who? Annabelle Davis is the name of the gr- the woman who played his daughter. Is that his actual daughter? Mm, could have been. Huh. Wikipedia says daughter of Warwick Davis. Warwick Davis who and knew? Samantha Davis, yeah. Yeah, who knew? Wow. All right, so, well, so that let, let's flip over to episode two and three, and we'll we'll sort of go through the events there, and we can sort of see what we think from there. So, uh, episode two, my elevator pitch: uh, the secrets of Willow, Sorsha, and Alora's past are revealed, and a new fellowship is forged to find Eric and stop the Withered Crone. Again, those are all just a bunch of words that basically mean, "Hey, we're now a fellowship. We're all going to go off and try and find this missing person." Um, mm-hmm. 
And take the ring back to Mordor. And take the ring back to Mordor. Mm-hmm. We're mm-hmm. going to the immemorial city where we have to drop a ring into a lava lake of fire. It uh, it was kind of a dark episode. Like there was a lot of like sort of you know Willow's kind of being a you know a little. I mean, I guess the first half was funny and the second half was dark. The first half is full of Easter eggs from Willow. Right? He uh, he is basically doing what uh billy barty did it as the grand no in, in the first movie where he's like i will consult the bones and he pours the bones on the floor and he's like oh what that means it's all theater right and then he has to do the finger test which you know in the power to save the universe is in which finger and yours 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 uh so that was funny but the second half kind of get takes a dark turn where you know yeah he's like you know kind of being a little bit mean to Alora and really not letting her get used to the idea that all of a sudden she's this chosen one. And he's kind of, you know, barking orders at her to, to learn the message. Clearly that's supposed to be rooted in him and yelling at her for the way she pronounces a word. Yeah. Jordan? Yeah. I know what kind of monster would do people like that. I, just, yeah, I know. Yeah. Eh? But, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was, you know, kind of a weird, like it did not make you endeared to this character. So again, if you were coming into this and you're like, oh, show's called Willow. Must be what this guy Willow. What's Willow like? Oh, turns out he's a huge crank. Like, you know, he, he didn't seem like yeah, a good I did, guy. I did find that odd. I did find that odd that he sort of, he was sort of this pain in the butt, annoying guy. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, and yeah, so then we get this like uh, MacGuffin that they're all after too. We get the story about the the Chimerian cuirass, which is this magical armor, yeah. right? And mm-hmm. so there's this whole sort of sub story with Borman and Kit and Mad Mardigan and his quest to find this armor. And so this, I'm sure, will all come around as well. Um, yeah, I don't know what what uh, I mean. What were your impressions of the second episode? Did you find it was more clarifying or more confusing? Um. I feel like it was less of the plot dump that we got out of part one, where they sort of mm-hmm. like give you a lot. I felt like we had a little bit more to to sort of feel what what Willow is like. What is he? What has he been doing all this time? And this is where I got the the sort of Luke Skywalker, but not from the original trilogy, but from the sequel trilogy sort of feel, right? Mm-hmm. Where mm-hmm. he's um, got a little bit of the the orneriness in him uh in his relationship with Alara is is a little bit like Luke's relationship with Ray uh as as covered there um but they they did have it be a little bit more humorous where uh when he's got all the the folks uh together and he's getting heckled and even one of them is his apprentice he's like oh that was my apprentice I was hoping for <laughs> unconditional support there <laughs> yeah know? it's not going well um and it uh it uh, to me seemed like a, a a decent spot to go, right? So he like tries to to teach her uh, the magic, and she's struggling even with the words uh, to to say. And uh, ultimately, she does have that magic, right? It it sprouts at the very end when she's taken. So um, I feel like it was happier with episode two that that seemed less like you had to know everything that was. Um, from the movie um it yeah kind of felt like they were explaining down, it to you like yeah mm-hmm. yeah it definitely felt like the pace was it was a change from episode one to, to two they were kind of just throwing things at you a lot in the first one and the second one you had a little more chance to sort of digest yeah one of the quotes yeah. that i had written down uh when we were talking about the luke skywalker of it all Willow literally says the line, there is an energy that flows through all living things i was like is he gonna start talking about the force like oh mid chlorine <laughs> yeah like you know oh yeah wouldn't you have just died there's actually these little things that live in your cells they're symbionts do you know what a symbiont is yeah kill me um yeah it was uh, yeah it was it was again it was a bit of an inconsistent episode there was stuff that i really liked about it but it was also a little bit um uneven and i did find the portrayal of willow to be uneven i felt like in We'll talk about episode three in a sec, but I found that in episode three, it became clearer why he's been so, uh, you know, reticent to show his magic and reticent to, Mm -hmm. you know, and and so, you know, why he's felt it so imperative to push Alora so hard. But, you know, especially and then we get the flashbacks, right? We get the flashbacks where he's like, 
he's basically trying to kidnap her and you know would you like to come live with me in the forest like it just was a little yeah. creepy yeah. Yeah. you should you shouldn't hang around the schoolyard anymore sir. <laughs> yeah especially with that mustache that they put on him it was the little goatee that he had on with the braid like you've got a bit of a yeah. dirtbag vibe going on willow maybe it's time for you to go back to uh, your village get your van and go away yeah. <laughs> that's right that's right so that brings us to episode three, which is this week's episode, The Battle of the Slaughtered Lamb. Mm-hmm. Very ominous title. Uh, my elevator pitch was the, the Fellowship, uh, which is what I'm calling it, because come on. Mm-hmm. Uh, fellow, uh, fellowship faces its darkest moments so far with sword fights, kidnapping, and death. Um, so this one basically centers around them trying to move towards this immemorial city where they're going to try and rescue Eric. They're all going together, but at one point they decide to sort of split up. Half of them go one way, half go the other. Um, and they're trying to catch up with uh, Ballantyne and his his group of, of zombified uh, knights who have kidnapped Alora. A weird sort of um, digression where Alora ends up in the woods and encounters Hannah Waddingham. Uh, from yeah. from Ted Lasso, uh, that was a strange twist. Who who you know is this sort of fun and folksy character, and then gets snuffed like ten minutes later. Like strange. yeah, like that that would have been a great addition to the fellowship for sure, right? Yeah, like it was just it was so mm-hmm. so like that is the epitome of cameo. Like, come on, work for twenty minutes and you're done. Like it just it was so weird. The sort of thing that had this feeling, and I never came back to correct myself. I wrote here at this point in the episode, my big question was, is, uh, and I didn't look at the actress's name. I said, is Rebecca this version of Tom Bombadil? Um, and and <laughs> yeah. not real. I mean, yeah. yes, if Tom Bombadil gets snuffed, <laughs> I suppose, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but maybe not. I, I have no idea what happened there other than to uh, give a nice cameo and introduce some, some guilt to Elora, right? That like the, the bad guy tells her, you know, th- this was your fault. These people died because you didn't go along with what we told you to do. Yeah. Yeah. So we have this sort of weird, you know, she goes off on her sort of side quest. And then, uh, you know, the, the hero split up. So Borman and Kit end up going to this where the, the slaughtered lamb inn is supposed to be. Uh, you know, clearly Borman's got his own agenda. Uh, we do see that he finds this this MacGuffin part of the of the uh, cuirass, the armor, and um, and then of course they all sort of come back together, and there's this big sort of fight. Hence the battle of the slaughtered lamb. It's basically it's the the zombified knights versus the fellowship. They have this this sort of knockdown throwout, and we lose another member of the the group. Um, it, that felt a little unnecessary to me, but. Sure, it's got to advance the plot. Willow had to make a choice. He was trying to not use his magic. He doesn't use his magic. His friend gets killed, you know, and then he uses his magic and they win, right? So. Well, his friend gets injured and then he uses his magic and then that's not enough to save his friend. Well, but I don't think the magic was supposed to. Yeah, like he gets kind of thrown. From... I don't think it, the magic was to, to end the end the conflict with the with the bad guys, right? Yeah, so, true, which, true. Which it, it does, right? Yeah, although his friend gets. Pardon me to little people, but he gets dwarf tossed into a brick wall, or mm-hmm. cliff wall. Like he, he he's gonna die anyway. But um, at that point, he'd already been stabbed in the stomach. I went back and watched it again. So yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, I did flag that. The the I like the humor between Willow and Silas. Like I thought Silas was a fun, yeah. funny, funny character. Yeah. The the part where at the beginning where they're trying to stop Valentine the first time, and he says, "I need a diversion. Help them. Go shiv someone." Uh, was was a great line. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, it, uh, yeah, again, bit of a bummer episode. Of course it starts pouring rain and then they, you know, are trying to figure out where they are. And Willow's like, let's not go this way. And they're like, it's the easiest way. Let's just go this way. They go that way. And of course they find themselves at Nakmar. Nakmar is where the final battle happened in the Willow movie. So now they're, oh, really? they're, they're back at Castle Nakmar, which is, yes, the sort of center of evil where, where Bath Morda had her castle and. Uh, so yeah, obviously that'll be sort of the, the setting for the next, the next, uh, episode, but this one I found, you know, the pace was good. I found the episode, it was enjoyable a little more about the characters, you know, I, I, I thought this one was a sort of the most even episode so far and taken as, as a whole, the three episodes, I, I do like, you know, they're giving us more of the characters. 
there is still a lot of characters. Like they're really, it's. I'm finding it hard to really fall in love with any of them. Like I, I, I immediately, I think obviously Ellie Bamber's beautiful, but I, I think you're supposed to immediately feel very, you know, protective of her and 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 you know her sort of innocence and in, in this whole thing. I, I found myself liking her, um, but I can't say that I fall in love with like Kit or or Jade. You know, Graydon is kind of funny, but again, he's he's sort of the stereotypical reluctant hero kind of, you know, trope. Um, you know, again, Silas was funny, but he didn't really get a lot to do. Borman's funny, but again, he's kind of a weirdo. And Willow's been a crank. So I'm like, I think that if there was any sort of real nick, nick to pick in this show so far, it's that maybe there's a little too much going on and not enough time to really learn to like and or love all these characters too yeah i think a kid's probably the, the one character out of out of all that that i kind of like is is you know she's got that sort of um you know leader kind of quality to her like she's very sarcastic very realistic and you know like okay let's get on we look enough of the, enough of the fluff let's just get to the point kind of thing when, you know when borman's telling her a big long story and she's like you know tldr buddy yeah. you know What's the, the Monty um, Python? Get on with it. Yeah, get on with it, yeah. So I, I kinda like her as a character. Um I'm not so sure about the the character uh Jade, who, you know, I mean she was supposed to go off and, and you know, and the sort of the play between the two of them, like, you know, go off and do your thing. I thought you were gonna hang out with me for the rest of your life while I'm the you know, princess and you're just the hanger on and then and almost like the the admitting the admitting in this episode that well I kind of let you win you know mm-hmm. um, which is kind of an interesting you know reveal but because uh, you know she sort of be the had her, have inherited Matt Mardigan's you know sword skills you know yeah um, yeah but he never actually you know I don't I can't remember does he actually do any sword fighting in Willow I know he's he's sort of the oh, Matt oh yeah the he's whole great bit. remember the part he ends up uh, when when they come to uh, when they're trying to guard that one castle and he puts on the fancy armor and he's like yeah sword fighting all over the place he's great yeah yeah cause I just remember him from being in the cage at the very beginning where he's like yeah he's been left behind and and he's trying to convince Willow to let him out yeah you know that's that's sort of the Val Kilmery you know yeah. Um, time that's that's the that's the Mal, Cal, Val Kilmer typical character that he played back in that in those days right mm. um yeah I don't know it, it, it's I don't know I guess I, guess I kind of like all the characters you're right I am not I'm not enamored with um Warwick Davis's portrayal but that may be the, like you said maybe the reason why is because he's reserving he's being reserved and and maybe he's being a bit sort of almost like the con man that Billy Barty was you mm. know mm-hmm because uh, he was a bit of a con man in, in, you know, especially with the finger test and all that stuff, right? And the bones and whatever, right? But because um, he does have, you know, the, obviously the grand, uh, the high Aldwin does have power. Mm. But, you know, obviously, in, in as we find out in this episode, spoilers if you haven't watched it, you know, it does drain the user of the, of the, the craft, right? <laughs> they don't do much with other than other than her walking through the barrier, which I didn't make the connection with when, like you said, but because um, I I wondered about that scene where she reaches through and touches the butterfly and all that stuff, but um, you know, and and she touches when she lays her hands on the the um, I don't know zombified. Um, oh yeah, the zombie knights. Guardsmen. Yeah, yeah, the zombie knights. Yeah, and and they they kind of burn at, at her touch. I mean, why doesn't just run around and touch them all and get them to stop fighting them? You know, yeah, like, wasn't that the Harry Potter uh, and the, yeah, and the exactly. philosopher's stone? <laughs> just grab mm-hmm. them by the head until yeah. their head bursts into flames. You know? Yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm. Uh, yeah, you're 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 right. I think I think Kit is the one who sort of resonated the most. I the one part that I thought was really funny. I remember reading at some point it, earlier this year they were talking about how it was going to have this center of the story was going to be around this queer relationship. And it was a big deal for Disney plus that it was going to have this queer relationship at its core. And of course, in the first episode we see at first, what seems like a friendship between Jade and Kit. And then later on, uh, we see the two of them share a, you know, a a romantic kiss, not a, not a, a a, um, friendly kiss, a romantic kiss. And there's been a tension between the two of them since then. Obviously there's a lot of different reasons for that, but I wouldn't say that, they're acting like a couple that are in love. Like 
if well you know there's also as you said that i just thought about you know like think about it like you know i like because i remember the look on jade's face after kit kisses her it's like okay the princess just kissed me like who can i tell about this Mm -hmm. you know maybe if Mm -hmm. i'm not because she didn't look like she was super comfortable with it she just sort of went what the heck i just happened was the the look on her face but again it's a position of power kind of taking advantage of blah 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 you know yeah what casting catch i got a different vibe from that though i got a vibe that she was much more like i this is what i've always wanted but i'm gonna leave soon what i'm saying is you could twist it as a me too kind of thing right yeah um Mm -hmm. But but the other the other thing I think that's interesting about this whole thing is is the damsel damsel in distress in this show is a man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a positive. Yeah, I mean it, it, you're right. If this show was made, you know, God, five years ago, let alone twenty years ago, uh, it would have been the princess being kidnapped and the prince going to to the rescue. You're right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I uh, yeah the <laughs> the part that did make me laugh that I did like the chemistry between Borman and Kit when they go on that little side mission where. He goes down into the crypt and she's he's like, watch out for the were rats. Um, mm-hmm. You know, um, what are were rats? I, I like when the were rats show up and she kills the one. She says, if I get bit, yours is the first flesh I'm tasting. That was pretty funny. I, I, mm. I, I do think that there's some good chemistry to be exploited there. But, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it feels like I'm hoping that maybe for the next episode, they'll they'll have a chance to bond. I feel like I want these people to like each other more. I want them to feel more, you know, say what you will about Lord of the Rings. It's a very straight laced movie. It's very serious about itself. All of those movies slash books, very earnest, very, very earnest. This one can both be playful and earnest, but in Lord of the Rings, at least when like from the moment that they're sort of there, like they're, they are like, I would die for you. You're like, everybody is on board for each other here. It still feels like, they're really easing into them becoming a team. You know, it's an eight episode series. We're three episodes in and they still feel like a group of individuals. I feel like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. we really need to see them come together soon. Oh, maybe this battle was the one that, that sort of um, knit them together. Right. So, yeah, because, you know, this is the first time that they've all been involved in a skirmish against, you know, other people. Right. Cause before that they were, you know, they were, they're, should we you know why are they like kit's mission is to go rescue her brother and yet you know it seems to be that that uh laura dannon coming back to save the entire you know world or defeat the evil empire or whatever you know yeah is the it seems to be the, the they want to paint that as the bigger story even though you know and and um kit's point is the longer we take to get to my brother the worse it could be for him right mm-hmm. you know because he's not been at, at, kidnapped by normal people right no no yeah it'd be interesting i'm curious and and i think this is exactly what we were just talking about with prodigy you know a few minutes ago with prodigy i feel like it needs a second season with this one i'll be curious to see if this sort of wraps itself up or if they're leaving this sort of like is is the whole you know and we're going to defeat this evil crone at the end of the first season and and Mm -hmm. wrap it up or are we going to need more runway here yeah yeah I mean, it kind of really depends, right? Like, I, I am revising my question now that I know that, that Rebecca's not Tom Bombadil is, um, <laughs> you, know, you know, is this leading towards a somehow Bev Morda has returned kind of moments is what I'm keeping my eyes out for. Well, again, Bev Morda didn't die. She didn't die in the, in the movie. She was banished. Right. And they show that in the recap, too, which had me starting getting suspicious about this crone talk and uh and would she be the one who returns yeah or or is she some other you know aspect of of all this i I think that would be interesting anyway Mm -hmm. i i I don't want this to come across like i'm completely negative i am happy to be back in this world there is a lot of stuff that i like i do feel like tim you mentioned uh kevin pollack uh you know the 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 um what are they called brownies that you know i'm hoping that at some point soon yeah. the two of them will show up and give us a little more humor and just some some fun i think that's what the absence of of mad mardigan and, and val kilmer is is taken away from it's 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 missing that sort of playfulness the 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 relationship because willow wasn't funny willow was the straight man in the first movie he was very much like very earnest trying his hardest doing things for the right reasons. Matt Mardigan was the, the element of chaos. I think, you know, uh, they need to figure out 
who's what in this whole dynamic and, and to for it to start to sort of click a little bit but uh but i'm 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 so happy that this exists and i'm i'm really looking forward to seeing how the rest of this plays out mhm cool. did you both watch the guardians of the galaxy holiday special yes i did and what were your impressions of the guardians of the galaxy holiday special <laughs> it's a it's a fun holiday special it it it's maybe sets up some stuff uh beyond being a, a sort of one off yeah um maybe set some some stuff for the uh the volume 3 yep uh, really really depends on where they where they go with things yeah it it definitely does that actually i heard a really good interview with james gunn the other day and uh he said yeah we were kind of trying to backdoor some stuff so that we wouldn't have to do as much lifting for guardians 3 because you'll already know it if you've watched this so the the whole like they bought nowhere from the collector that they've got the sort of community all living together in this space now that was all you know so that they don't have to talk about it again when they when you come around to part three you're just like oh yeah they own this place this is where they live now and you sort of run from there but uh i thought it was super funny and fun and, and fun i you know again it was goofy and nonsensical and everything else but it was i mean it was funny it was just funny the stuff with kevin yeah. bacon the stuff with you know yeah. mantis and and uh drax just their their absolute absurdity of the two of them going on an adventure together and they they did kind of get backbenched a little bit they had a good chemistry in in guardians 2 they kind of got backbenched a little bit as sort of supporting characters so to get them out in, in the front of this was kind of fun and let them be the sort of stars of the show because they were kind of muscle and you know uh, one special ability for for the last few adventures they've been on together so that was kind of nice um mm -hmm. but yeah just you know the way the two of them kind of rip into each other was was really kind of funny uh, do you think you could toss me over this gate? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we got Quill the worst gift ever, gift ever, a disgusting actor. <laughs> yeah. And Quill's response, this isn't a Christmas gift. This is human trafficking. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, it was, it was fun. It was, I, I enjoyed it um, for what it is again. Can we, can we talk about the siblings that get, you know, revealed in this show without giving it away for people yeah i mean you take your risks folks here we are talking about this you might get an occasional spoiler but yes there's there's are they are they meant to be kurt kurt uh what's his kurt name Russell, um, yeah yeah kids yeah i mean ostensibly the idea is that uh she is um uh, she's in her sort of like, baby form yeah. when she is taken and mm -hmm. planted on ego and therefore is raised by ego and therefore is essentially um yeah they share a father uh her and quill so, i mean like like a birth father or a no parent father no they they wouldn't be biologically uh okay. although again it's not like he went around the universe finding young women to have his way with like zeus sort of did well that's know? it so so maybe that's the interpretation too is maybe he's um you know he actually fathered this it's a waif yeah yes child at some point too but um no i think that's good i mean you know quill quill's story since guardians 2 has been just bummer after bummer after bummer after bummer right like he loses his his adopted dad he loses his mom in the first one he loses his adopted dad in the second one we go to the avengers uh movies and he loses uh when oh, they lose groot of course on their first adventure and then they uh go on this thing with the avengers where they try and go after thanos and he loses his partner in gamora right like giving him something of a connection something where he's not so isolated i think was was nice i think that was a nice part of the story because this guy's had a crappy 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 few years uh tim you must have you had your your ears up when when the episode starts and they do the flashback scenes and they do the book the bookend scenes in animation style mm -hmm. they did the full uh ralph bakshi rotoscope animation that was awesome mm -hmm. i was like so excited when they did that i'm like oh my god it's ralph bakshi stuff mm -hmm. that was cool that was really cool yeah that was my pew 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 uh that the animation was i think 3d cell animation but made to look like rotoscope a la rankin bass is what i think it was but I would need to see if there's a VFX artist uh, talking about that. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it was it was uncanny. As soon as I saw it, I was like, "Oh my god!" It's like it's like yeah, old Ralph Bakshi stuff. It's like uh, heavy metal. It looked like 
Mm -hmm. So many of those, you know, late 70s, early 80s uh, animated sort of pushing the envelope of animation, cell animation. Uh, Yeah, that that really hit me in my in my sweet love of animation. Definitely. But yeah, no, I thought it was good. I would definitely recommend this as, uh, you know, you don't need to know a lot. You could just sit back and and, you know, have some hot cocoa and laugh your butt off if you're looking for some fun Christmas fare. Definitely. The the quotes really quickly, the, the quotes that I had, uh one each from um uh related to, to Mantis and Drax. So Mantis saying Steve to just some some guy dressed as Captain America in front of the Man Chinese oh, yeah. Theater. That's right. In, That's right. In LA. And a uh a tourist saying, I took a picture with the God of War, which yeah, is an interesting cut to, yeah. to say that he's Kratos from God of War rather than being Drax. <laughs> and in that, there was a guy that Drax does not like because they're dressed as a GoBot, which I thought was also <laughs> yeah. kind of a weird one. Um, the, the, the GoBots, for those who don't know, were the alternative or competitor. They were like the Pepsi to Coke uh when it comes to the Transformers. Transformers. Oh, come yeah. on. They were the RC Cola to Coke. <laughs> the tab. <laughs> That's, yeah, you got it. You got it. They were not, uh, they were not the biggest brand, but uh, yeah. Yeah, th- th- there was so many little funny, funny jokes in there. Even the part where they go to the bar and they're doing the shots. I mean, so many goofy, funny parts in that, uh, that thing. The part where they, they, they're trying to steal the ornaments, uh, the decorations off of Kevin Bacon's lawn. Like, oh my God. I want the little man. Yeah, and how he's talking to Kara Sedgwick on the on the um it, the phone. It was right? really Kira too. I I looked it up. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, that was really yeah. funny. Yeah. Like that's quite the cameo to get her to you know talk a couple lines into a cell phone. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's move to the watch list. Uh first thing up I thought we, you guys would be really excited about is the nineties show has come back. Um the was it the Vista Cruiser rides again? Yeah. <laughs> the opening. I don't know if you guys seen that yeah. one, but uh yeah. It's the, the, I guess, the foreman's kids have come back to move back in with grandparents, right? So yep. the grumpy grandfather and... Did, did you catch what her name of, is? Uh, no, I forgot. Mm-hmm. It's Leia. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Leia, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Which, if, you, of course it if is. you're a fan of the show, you completely understand because, yeah, Eric's obsessed with Star Wars. So that's very funny. Yes. Yeah, definitely, for sure. I, I I think I've told you before that like the episode where he's trying to convince his friends to go watch Star Wars after he sees it in the theater, like that. I literally did that that weekend. I saw that movie. I convinced my friends to go back on this. I saw it on the on the Friday night, and I convinced them to go see it on the Sunday. But, and then we're sitting in there, and I'm listening to R two D two and and C three PO talk in the beginning. I'm like, oh my god, my friends are gonna hate this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, they blew up the Death Star again, so it was all good. Yep. Anyway. Um, yeah, so that looking forward to that one. That'll be fun to kind of watch. I didn't watch the entire of entirety of the '70s show. I used to watch it in reruns. I didn't watch it when it was like in prime time. But um, so yeah, I'm familiar with the characters. But I, you know, didn't again. Like I said, I didn't watch it in, when it was on on TV. So I might watch bits and pieces of this one or PVR or something. Well, it's on Netflix, um, right? Yeah. So that makes it easier. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, so I'll I'll watch it in a weekend. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Yep. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Netflix. Yep. Um, thanks for ruining my life. But, um, yeah, and I, I do want to call out Slow Horses, which I talked about at the very beginning of the the show. I mean, I watched season one, and I highly, I still highly recommend season one. Um, it sounds like, based on what I was saying earlier, that the books are going to be, like, each show, each season is going to be an arc out of one of the books. And there are five books, so who knows? We might get to see this. So um, Gary Oldman plays Jackson Lamb, which is the name of the character who's this mythical um you know great mi5 agent that uh and, but he's now in his sort of end of career and he's he's just you know kicking back in this this uh slow office right like you know he's sort of the what do you call it the, the remote office not he's not in the head office anymore and he's not got all the shiny assignments and stuff like that and he doesn't care you know so and he's got these these misfit um agents that he's working with too and he's super hypercritical of them he's very much like you know almost like Billy Barty would be in, in, in Willow sort of thing. So it's a good show. I mean, it's really intelligently written and, and all that kind of stuff. And I highly recommend that. That's Disney Plus. And, no, um, Disney Plus. That's uh, Apple TV Plus, right? Apple Plus. Yes. Apple Plus. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, Good Night Oppie is, I think I mentioned it before, it's the document, it's sort of a documentary that they've kind of like, they kind of, they pull at your heartstrings on this one. 
Um, I don't know if you guys realize this, but uh, Mars is the only planet in our solar system completely occupied by machines. Inhabited that by machines. we know of. Mm-hmm. That we know of, yes, exactly. So, um, but Goodnight Oppie is about opportunity and spirit, the two um, droids, let's call them. No, the two rovers that went to Mars. They were meant to last 90 days, and Oppie ended up lasting 15 years. So, um, as you go through the story, you meet, it, it, they kind of tell it in a sort of a, a making of sort of thing. They, they introduce Oppie as a character initially, like, you know, the, the fact figures about it. But then they go back to the very beginning where it it's the robots on the drawing board, right? And the the uh, I think he's a geologist who comes up with the idea of sending a geolo- a, a rover to Mars to do geology because that's essentially what they did in the later. Like by the way, I don't know if you know it's the 50th anniversary of Apollo 17 this weekend, right? Yep. So uh, and and that was by the time 16 and 17 came along, they were. They were, pre- in fact, Harris and Smith, who went up on, on, I believe he went on the 17 with Gene Cernan, he actually was a geologist, not an astronaut, right? Because at that point in time, they, they discovered that they, they could learn about the Earth from, or they learn about the moon from the rocks on the moon. That's why they went, around, went up there and collected all those rocks, right? But, um, but Good Night Oppie, is, it's a really interesting um, movie uh, from the point of view of, of and, you, and you, you know, there's like, two or three generations of people who worked on Oppie, or Opportunity, I should say. And um, yeah, it's, it really pulls at your sort of heartstrings and, and, you know, builds up the drama and that kind of stuff. So if you're into any kind of space exploration, I do recommend you watch this movie. And that's uh, those are my picks for this week. And we'll pass over to Jaime. Yeah, a few things I've got. One is uh, Netflix, a documentary series called Pepsi, Where's My Jet? About the uh, the mid-90s lawsuit that occurred where Pepsi had this oh, right, rewards yeah. loyalty type program where you could you could get, you know, cool swag like, you know, a gym bag that has the Pepsi logo or a t-shirt, a sweater kind of thing. But they, depending who you believe, may have offered a uh, Harrier jet with uh, seven million points, which was believed to be unobtainable. And it's a it's a good four part uh, series. They talked to a bunch of folks, uh, folks from Pepsi, obviously the folks who were involved in, in the lawsuit and stuff. And uh, it's it's interesting. They're pretty breezy. They're about uh, like forty minutes per episode, I think. So you can you can finish it fairly fairly quickly. So I thought that was uh, that was a good one. Um, especially I watched as the trailer. Grew- I, mm-hmm. I watched the trailer for that one, Jaime, and I must admit I was intrigued, and I was actually kind of hoping one of you two would watch it first to let me know if it was worth watching. Does it? I was surprised to see that. I thought maybe it was like an hour and a half documentary. I was surprised to see that it was like four parts and it's like almost four hours, right? It is. So if they're like 40 a piece, half, 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 that's two. Yeah, it's like two, two thirty, two forty five, maybe. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's, it's on does the longer sus- side. Does it sustain okay for that? Like, that was my only thought was like, I mean, is this going to be good enough to make me want to watch that long of this one topic? Ooh, that's a good question. I, I didn't find it dragging at any point, but some of it was because uh, they fill in sort of the cultural context for sort of what was going on in the 90s and um, what Pepsi was it trying to do and, and, and getting to do some like like real um, out of nowhere stuff that I didn't know about of like other Pepsi uh, promotions that had gone wrong. Uh, so without spoiling too much when Manny Pacquiao shows up briefly in one of the episodes, I was like, Whoa, where's this going? Um, and, and, you know, I, I did grow up as the, the, the Pepsi generation, like the, the sorts of marketing materials they were doing were absolutely aimed at people like me. And I, I am a Pepsi drinker. It is my, my preferred one when I choose, uh, I will drink Coke. I will drink Dr. Pepper and other things, but, uh, I, I, I am the one who's always saying, like, when they go into these test tests, how can you not tell the difference between Coke and Pepsi? Like, it, you you like one or the other. How could you ever get confused of which one is which? Um, so it's it's got that. Uh, it, and it's also got a, a little bit of, of Cindy Crawford in there, because, of course, it has to, yeah. given her, yep. her great commercial from that era. Yeah. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah, I, I, that, I had put that on my, like, uh, maybe list. So I'm, I'm glad you liked it, because I, I definitely think I'll check that one out now. My next one here is uh, a couple of videos from YouTube. So let me lead into it. So if you were like me and you watched the Andor series, all 12 episodes, you asked yourself, why, oh, why, when I click 
skip intro, does Disney Plus not actually skip the intro? It skips the, like, Lucasfilm's part, but it doesn't really actually skip the part of, like, get past the logo or get to the last, you know, one and a half seconds of logo. And maybe there was a reason. So I feel really dumb not noticing that. And the first video here is the episode, uh, the first episode of Andor and its opening title card. And then the second episode is somebody stitched together all of the title themes played together at once from all of the episodes. And it's actually like, you know, more instruments come in. It's almost like a full orchestra instead of, you know, uh, one, one instrument here and there. And people were claiming like, oh, maybe this is meant to be symbolic or metaphoric of the rebellion coming together from a bunch of disparate pieces and parts. So if, if that's actually what happened, it's actually pretty cool. Is it? It sounds pretty good in the combined one. And I never even noticed that that was happening. No, nor did I. That's, mm. that's a really cool thing. Huh. I guess we'll check it out. I think you're up, Don. Yeah, so uh, I am a big fan of the TV show Archer. I've uh, been watching it since very early in its run. The latest season is now on Netflix here in Canada. And uh, I had pvr the episodes off of uh off of tv when they were on earlier this summer but it's been a crazy stretch with so much other content that it had sort of slipped through the cracks for me and so i sat down and watched it's a pretty re- a relatively short season it's only eight episodes at, at you know 22 minutes a piece so it was uh you know sat down and plowed through them in a in a day but um i wasn't sure how it was gonna be because this was the first season where we had no Mallory, because of course the actress who played uh, her died. So I wasn't sure what to expect. I wasn't sure where they were going to go with it, uh, but I was happy with this season. It was definitely, uh, you know, uh, funny and return to form and very much more uh, classic Archer kind of stuff. And uh, so if you're a fan of the show, have no fear. Yes, of course, we, we definitely miss uh, that character, but. Uh, there's just still a lot of laughs and a lot of good, a lot of good, funny, goofy, dark humor in there that uh, that definitely sustains and even even in spite of that app. So I would say. Uh, so they're back from space now, or what? yeah, I mean there was a whole series of seasons where they were supposed to be during uh, Archer was in a coma, and so they were all these different weird. There was one in space. There was one in the jungle. There was all kinds of different adventures. There was a crime noir one. Uh, they were all supposed to be inside Archer's head when he was recovering from being shot. And then uh, a couple seasons back, he actually wakes up the back in the real world and they sort of start to hit the reset button and go back to sort of the more classic Archer, the spy agency kind of adventures. And and that's where the season is, is is sort of back more them going on sort of crazy spy missions and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, I I have not had a bad season yet. There are certainly some that are stronger than others, but uh, but this one definitely holds its own. It's very funny. So definitely encourage people, if they're fans, to check it out. Mm, cool. Is that it? Or you want to talk about the other stuff you have listed here? Well, I can. So I just wanted to, to flag. So um, I was trying to math things out as far as, you know, when when things are on. So Prodigy is now going, its last episode is going up on the 29th of December. So we've got uh, three more episodes this month, and then that's over with. The next Star Trek thing we have doesn't start until February 16th. So that's six weeks later on Picard. Uh, Season three, the final season of that, is coming then. In between then, we also have uh, Bad Batch, which starts on January 4th. Uh, The Last of Us comes on HBO on January 15th. And, uh, of course, we talked earlier about The Mandalorian coming on March 1st. And then, in uh, obviously, Willow is carrying forward. Willow runs from what's on right now. Its final episode is uh, actually on my birthday, which is on uh, January the 11th. So, um, yeah, we've still got a, a fair bit of content in there. So, I guess we'll have to have a, a, a Spotcast uh, Slack meeting to decide how much of this we actually want to cover. But uh, yeah, we've, we're, we're. You mean we could actually end season five in the same year that it started? <laughs> we could. We could. <laughs> uh, it's a, yeah, it's just a question of whether we want to cover to the end of Willow or if we want to talk about any of those other shows. But yeah, we could theoretically, we could wrap up on the 29th uh, and then take a break and then come back and do Picard and wrap up some of that other stuff. We're, uh, we're enjoying it. But yeah, it's. Uh, it's the first time in a while that we've had like a, a 
prolonged gap in this time of year on Star Trek. Last year, remember? Wait, so did in season five, did we even cover Discovery? Yeah. We did? Yeah. Oh, season oh, okay. five. You mean season five the one, is what we're on right now? No. Spotcast season no, five. No, season, season, season four. Five. Remember, because season four, basically, it started with Lower Decks. I know. It was it was the, the you know, the, the fellowship of the season four. And then, yeah. Cause, and this one is this one is sort of the, the season five, the Silmarillion, right? <laughs> yeah. This will mm-hmm. be the, the much shorter version, because, yeah, season four, we started in August with Lower Decks. That was August of 2020. And it carried us all the way through until spring of or was august august of 2021 and carried us all the way through until the end of the summer because they basically did back to back to back to back to back to back to back truck shows right it was lower decks yeah. into prodigy into picard into uh, into uh what was the other one discovery and then into uh strange new worlds right so we had basically a new star trek show for like 40 consecutive weeks hmm here we get a, a delightful six week break before we, we jump back into uh sure to get into Picard. Right. All right, well I guess that's it for another week. So hey Jonathan people we'll get in touch with you wherever they find you. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram as at GPK News or on YouTube as youtube.com slash at JPK to think about that one. Yeah. And uh how many people get in touch with you wherever they find you? I'm on Twitter as at Dev the Hair. All right, my name is Timitra, T-I-M-M-I-T-R-A. On the Twitter machine is where you can find me, but you can also find me at mastodon.social slash at Timitra, if you like. So I'm hanging out on Mastodon more these days than Twitter, but, you know, I don't think Twitter's going anywhere. That's my prognostication. If like Facebook, everybody left Facebook, and it's still there. Go figure. Anyway, so until next time, we'll see you in the future. Bye. 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 Bye.